May 2nd, 2023. I am Rifat Mandan in California, and I am remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal in Boston. Today, we are very delighted to welcome back Dr. Yasmin Butt, who is an assistant professor of pathology at Mayo Clinic, Arizona. And uh, she is today going to present a high yield pulmonary pathology topic, which we think would be very useful for the trainees who are preparing for boards. So uh, that title is, of course, High Yield Pulmonary Pathology. So over to you, Dr. Butt, and thanks so much for, for sparing your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so, so I'll be talking to you today about pulmonary pathology as a uh, board review topic. And as uh, I was mentioning earlier, I think this is a pretty massive undertaking and and in retrospect I probably should have asked uh, for the my lovely colleagues to give me several additional hours to talk about this. So this will be a whirlwind uh, review of both some neoplastic pre predominantly and a few non-neoplastic uh, uh, topics in pulmonary pathology. So uh, with that I'll jump right in. And, you know, most of the talks that I give, I try to be more pragmatic about, you know, signing these cases out. For this particular talk, it's, it's more informational and to try to help you with your board success and multiple choice type questions. Okay, so we're just going to jump right in. So here are some neoplastic pulmonary pathology uh, topics. And um, this is not a comprehensive list, but these are the areas that I'm going to review today. So we'll talk about non-small cell carcinomas, uh, 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 small cell carcinomas, uh, all the neuroendocrine lesions, uh, uh, which, by the way, are not on a spectrum. I always like to point that out. Carcinoid tumors don't uh, change into small cell carcinomas or change into large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas. We'll talk about a few uh, pleural-based lesions, mesothelioma, solitary fibrous tumor. I'll touch on a couple of rare tumors that I think are fairly testable. And we'll mention a few adenomas, which again, I think are testable, a few mesenchymal tumors, as well as pachomatous tumors, lymphangioliomyomatosis and pachomas themselves. So let's jump right in. So we'll have, start off with a brief review of non-small cell carcinoma. So probably what is most common is adenocarcinoma spectrum lesions. So these are non-mucinous adenocarcinoma lesions. You have adenocarcinoma in situ, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, and then invasive adenocarcinoma, which is, of course is going to be your most common. And in invasive adenocarcinomas, you want to remember that we always learn our, uh, always mention our histologic subtypes, lipidic, acinar, papillary, micropapillary, and solid. And the reason for that is it drives the current grading scheme. Um, we'll talk about squamous cell carcinoma, mucinous adenocarcinoma, and as well as sarcomatoid carcinomas. So the grading scheme for non-mucinous lung adenocarcinoma is well, moderately, and poorly differentiated. And as I mentioned, it's based off of the patterns. So if you have a lipidic pr pattern uh, predominant tumor with no or less than 20% of a high-grade pattern, that would be considered well differentiated. Moderately differentiated is acinar or papillary predominant with no or less than 20% of a high-grade pattern. And then poorly differentiated is any tumor with more than uh, or equal to 20% of a high-grade pattern. And those high-grade patterns are solid. Uh, micropapillary, and then uh, a little bit frustratingly, they also add cribriform and complex glandular patterns, which are uh, technically under the acinar pattern, uh, but they're considered poorly differentiated, uh, even though acinar is considered moderately differentiated. So a little bit of a confusing aspect in the current grading scheme, um, but I'm hoping that that will be fixed in subsequent editions of the WHO. Uh, and right now, you know, we have these 20% cutoffs, but I think in the future, it's going to turn into 5% cutoffs. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, bronchovalvular carcinoma. This is terminology that you will see, hopefully not on your boards, but anytime I talk about non-small cell carcinoma, I have to bring this up um, because what used to be called BAC is now called lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma, which has a good prognosis, mucinous adenocarcinoma, which technically has a poor prognosis, adenocarcinoma in situ, which has an even better prognosis than lipidic predominant, minimally invasive, also with a good prognosis, and then in situ, mucinous adenocarcinoma, which technically exists, but I hardly ever make this diagnosis. So really BAC is a poor terminology and please don't use it. 
Okay, so IHC and lung cancer, again, I'll, don't worry, we'll get to some pictures here soon. Uh, IHC and lung cancer, again, uh, something that you may see pop up on your boards. Uh, adenocarcinoma, of course, is going to be positive for TTF1 and napsin, as well as CK7. Squamous cell carcinoma will be positive for P40, P63, CK56, and then your small cell uh, will also be positive for TTF1 in addition to your neuroendocrine markers. Uh, it's important to keep note that P63 can stain up to a quarter of lung adenocarcinoma, so I think it's a, an inferior your stain in the lung when it comes to squamous cell carcinoma, and that neuroendocrine markers in the absence of neuroendocrine uh, morphology are not clinically significant. So if you don't see neuroendocrine morphology, um, you know, rosettes, uh, things that make you think of small cell, um, et cetera, uh, please don't run neuroendocrine markers. So here are uh, adenocarcinoma spectrum lesions. So uh, atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, you might be uh, tested on this. These uh, is This is not a biopsy diagnosis. It's typically incidental. Uh, they will measure less than or equal to about five millimeters. Adenocarcinoma in situ is a pure lipidic pattern, less than or equal to three centimeters. Minimally invasive adenocarcinoma is going to be lipidic predominant, but that you can have some invasion, uh, which is less than or equal to five millimeters. And remember, invasion is any pattern other than lipidic. Okay, and so, you know, by definition, acinar, papillary, micropapillary, solid, that's invasion in the lung. Okay, so finally to some pictures. We got a lot of terminology we had to get out of the way. So here's an example of atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. Again, not going to be a biopsy diagnosis. So if your question stem says uh, a biopsy of a two centimeter lesion is performed, AAH is not your answer. Uh, these tend to be uh, less than or equal to five millimeters, although uh, this cutoff is not absolute. If you have one that is six millimeters and kind of looks like this, you can still call it. Um, AAH will have very mild atypia of uh, your pneumocytes. You can have have some thickening of the alveolar septa. Uh, this is an example right up at the edge of what I would accept as AAH. You'll typically find these in lobectomies or wedge resections for patients that have cancer elsewhere. Uh, in this particular case, a patient was a smoker. You can see some uh, pigmented macrophages uh, here. Here's an example of adenocarcinoma in situ. And as you can see, the atypia here in these pneumocytes really isn't much beyond what we saw in the AAH. However, it's the size criteria that's important. Um, so in order to call something AIS, you need to have a pure lipidic pattern. It has to be less than or equal to three centimeters. If something is 3.1 centimeters, 3.5 centimeters, uh, that criteria is uh, uh, absolute. Uh, it is now no longer AIS. It would be considered invasive after that size, even though I think from a biologic standpoint, Point. That doesn't make a ton of sense, but that is the current criteria. Here's an example of minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, or MIA. And again, remember for MIA, uh, you have to have less than or equal to five millimeters of an invasive pattern. And again, I think these are all pretty testable uh, uh, cri uh, cutoff for these criteria. Uh, in this particular case, it was a lipidic predominant uh, lesion with uh, less than, I think it was about two or three millimeters of acinar pattern in the center. So these uh, uh, angulated glands uh, with this desmoplastic stroma around it. So oftentimes on imaging, these will be described as ground glass uh, ground glass uh, nodules or masses, uh, usually uh, nodules, uh, with a central solid component. So just to keep in mind, um, for adenocarcinoma in situ and minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, these diagnoses should be rare pretty much less than 3%. Um, even if you look at some of the original studies on these cases where they looked at thousands of uh, grade one lesions, uh, only a few were actually located. So don't underdiagnose acinar or micropapillary patterns as lipidic. Uh, I don't think we're doing uh, patients any favors in the end by underdiagnosing uh, an invasive adenocarcinoma. So just a quick review of those patterns, since I think you can, uh, will definitely uh, need to be able to recognize these. So adenocarcinoma acinar subtype is one of the most common patterns you'll see. Very classic uh, carcin adenocarcinoma patterns with angulated glands, uh, hyperchromatic nuclei, uh, atypical kind of shapes here with some uh, desmoplastic stroma in the background. Here's a little bit higher picture of another uh, case. All right, so I think these are the most readily identifiable. Uh, here is an example of those cribiform or complex glandular patterns. And remember, when you see these, these are considered a high-grade pattern, even though they are technically acinar, which is considered a uh, intermediate grade. Uh, here's an example of a papillary pattern. Again, another very common architectural pattern, uh, also uh, synonymous with invasion. You see uh, distinct fibrovascular cores, just like papillary pattern in any other cancer. Okay, so, you know, back to those micropapillary and solid patterns that I had mentioned, these are important to identify uh, because it's a risk factor for predicting poor recurrence free survival in early stage lung adenocarcinoma. I think this is important to know uh, and important not to miss in your actual cases.
So here's an example of micropapillary subtype. Uh, remember, these have a worse prognosis, a worse disease-free survival. Uh, this is the more classic ones that I think most will have an easy time recognizing with these uh, little uh, uh, pseudo-rosette or florette type uh, uh, structures floating in alveolar spaces. You're not going to see true fibrovascular cores here. All right, here's a solid subtype, just sheets of solid uh, cases. You know, um, back to those stains that we were talking about. If I had a case like this, I think it's very reasonable to order a limited panel of TTF1 and P40 to make sure you're not looking at a squamous cell carcinoma, uh, a non keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, which could also look quite similar. Micropapillary is commonly missed. Um, you know, you have that classical florette like look that we just looked at, but uh, there are also uh, subtypes of this architectural subtype known as filigree, where you get delicate lace like narrow stacks uh, of tumor cells. They have to be at least three nuclei piled outward and they don't have fibrovascular cores. Uh, I think this has been out long enough that you may uh, see this pop up on your boards. Um, you can see stromal patterns, uh, airspace, uh, where, stromal patterns where you see nest of micropapillary cells infiltrating into the stroma. Of course, that would be called micropapillary. You can see those airspace micropapillary in a background of what looks like acinar or papillary or even lipidic. And when you see those examples, make sure to call it micropapillary poorly differentiated. They can form rings. They can form single cells, which tend to have higher cytologic features. Uh, you can also see some oma bodies when you have micropapillary patterns. Um, uh, and that can sometimes be a clue on low power that you're overlooking a, a pattern. So here's that classical floret uh, example, which I think everyone would um, be able to recognize. Uh, and here's another example here, nice little florets, no true cores. Uh, here that, here's that ring morphology that I mentioned, okay? And here are some somoma bodies in a case that has both papillary on the left side here, uh, as well as micropapillary with some ring forms here in the center. Uh, this is an example of that sneaky filigree that I talked about. Hopefully, if you saw a picture on boards, they wouldn't give you something so sneaky, but this is more of a real life example uh, where you have these piled up cells without any actual fibrovascular cores. And here's a higher power picture from a different case, again, showing you that filigree look. All right. And again, another example of that filigree can be very sneaky in there. Okay, um, this is uh, maybe a little bit more recognizable. You have these individual cells, uh, maybe a little florette here, and then also a filigree happening uh, as well. Uh, and to keep in mind, a lot of times with micropapillary, they tend to be a higher cytologic uh, uh, grade. Okay, this is micropapillary here in the background of acinar. You would call this field micropapillary rather than acinar, so it would be considered poorly differentiated. Uh, here's another example showing you a mixture on a needle core of acinar as well as micropapillary, which in my experience is often uh, misdiagnosed as lipidic. All right, and again, as I mentioned, these uh, often are called uh, ground glass, the micropapillary, because they are similar to lipidic and the uh, resolution of the imaging isn't gonna be able to differentiate between lipidic and micropapillary. Okay, so just a few important elements for staging to keep in mind. Again, uh, this may come up on boards. Uh, remember that your, your T stage is based on size. Uh, visceral pleural invasion in smaller lesions will bump you up to a PT2. Uh, of course, if the lesions are large enough to be a PT3, the visceral pleural invasion is just an element that you'll mention in your templates. Uh, spread through air spaces where you have individual tumor cells spreading away from the edges of the tumor. Uh, um, sorry, this should say does not change stage. I apologize. Um, and it's most commonly with a micropapillary pattern. Uh, your PN category is based on the lymph node level, so the location. Uh, so the more distal uh, lymph nodes are going to be PN1. When you become more proximal, you're going to end up with PN2. And I always like to mention a special staging category. When you have multifocal ground glass, so basically those adenocarcinoma spectrum lesions, uh, particularly in smokers, uh, and they're all very similar to each other, rather than having, uh, rather than calling it a PT3 or a PT4, depending on if it's um, they're in uh, the same uh, ipsilateral lobes, multiple different, or ipsilat, the same lobe or um, different lobes, um, you would actually stage those just based off of the largest lesion. Uh, and you'll typically see these in smokers. Okay, so that was a whirlwind through adenocarcinoma, um, uh, classic adenocarcinoma. Uh, let's make a, a minute or two on squamous cell carcinoma. So, you know, these can be keratinizing, non-keratinizing, or basaloid. Um, I think uh, 
you know, keratinizing uh, squamous cell carcinoma is pretty straightforward for everyone to diagnose. You look for that eosinophilic cytoplasm, uh, keratin bridges. Uh, you know, non-keratinizing may be tricky. It can form these solid base nests. You may consider doing a TTF1 and a P40. And in fact, especially on small biopsies, the WHO recommends uh, when in doubt, do these stains. Uh, and then I think basaloid carcinoma is probably the only uh, one that is uh, serves any kind of challenge. And that would be, you might mistake a basaloid squamous cell carcinoma for a small cell carcinoma, and immunostains will help you in those areas. Uh, so here's an example of a non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. You might argue there's a little bit of necrosis. Could that be some single cell keratinization there? But for the most part, this is non-keratinizing. You know, a reasonable uh, case to do a, a P40 and a TTF1. You know, keratinizing squamous cell carcinomas are very straightforward to diagnose. And then you have basaloid. Uh, this particular one looked like it may have had some keratinization here, uh, but you have this a bluer look uh, to the tumor. Um, and these can be a little bit trickier. And you may not immediately think about squamous cell carcinoma. Here's another example of a basaloid squamous cell carcinoma. Again, you might look at this and think, could this be a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma? Um, you know, probably not a small cell on this. There's a little too much cytoplasm. But sometimes these basaloid squames uh, can have less cytoplasm and have a little bit more of a spindled appearance. Um, so when in doubt, do your stains. P40 um, or P63, CK56, whatever you have in your lab, will certainly help you out. All right, so moving right along, um, let's look at uh, mucinous adenocarcinoma. So these are typically aggressive lesions, uh, often multifocal. Uh, they can actually mimic pneumonia and, and show ground glass changes, especially if they're bilateral. Uh, and with ground glass, they are going to look uh, for all the world like a, uh, a really bad pneumonia. Uh, remember, for mucinous, we don't support do we don't report subtypes. So for conventional type adenocarcinoma, that lipidic papillary acinar, that's really important. Um, but for mucinous, it's really not. Uh, and, you know, the reason behind that is most mucinous often has a lipidic pattern, but still does very poorly, which is the exact opposite of what you see in conventional type adenocarcinomas. Uh, you can have combined mucinous and non-mucinous adenocarcinomas. Um, remember that mucinous adenocarcinoma is often cytologically bland, and a good board question is there often show uh, KRAS mutations. So in terms of immunohistochemistry, definitely don't remember these percentages uh, because this is not an IHC game. Um, mucinous adenocarcinomas can be positive or negative for CK7, 20, TTF1, um, even CDX2. So they, they can have this enteric immunophenotype, which can be very confusing, uh, even in our primary lung mucinous adenocarcinoma. So for cases like this, um, differentiation from a pancreatic primary or a clonic primary can be really quite challenging. Uh, and typically, I will not actually stay in these cases. So here's an example of mucinous adenocarcinoma. You can see abundant apical mucin. This one has a little bit of a mixed uh, picture. Some of it looks a bit more like a conventional adenocarcinoma, but most of this is mucinous with this abundant apical mucin. Here's another example um, elsewhere in that biopsy. Again, abundant apical mucin there. Uh, here's a different case. Uh, this patient had a ground glass lesion. Again, remember lipidic or micropapillary will look like ground glass. This is very lipidic with these relatively bland looking cells, um, basally oriented nuclei, abundant apical uh, mucin, uh, where on a small biopsy, I think could be quite challenging um, and can be difficult to call adenocarcinoma, but in fact, this is mucinous adenocarcinoma. Here's another example. Uh, this patient also was uh, treated as a presumed refractory pneumonia. She eventually had a wedge performed and she had these little tufts of cells everywhere, which is often how mucinous adenocarcinoma grows. All right. So let's talk about um, unusual, some unusual histologic patterns of adenocarcinoma. These can be useful when identifying METs uh, or when you're considering uh, a lung primary. So this is actually a, an example of a hepatoid uh, lung adenocarcinoma. It has this very hepatic look to it, these kind of anastomosing cords. Um, these will stain, uh, their TTF1 will stain actually this granular uh, cytoplasmic look, uh, as you can see here, but the nuclei will actually be negative, which is often your first clue that you're looking at a hepatoid adenocarcinoma. You do a TTF1 on it on the case and the nuclei are negative, but you're getting this non-specific granular look. Uh, and then HEPAR1 is of course going to be strongly positive uh, in these cases. <clears throat> Enterotype ad adenocarcinoma is another one to, to keep an eye out for. These can, these uh, look and stain essentially identically uh, to colonic adenocarcinoma. They may or may not be TTF1 positive. Uh, if you have strong TTF1 positivity, that would support a lung primary enteric type adenocarcinoma. Uh, but I also uh, would like to point out that uh, 
there is a small subset of colon cancers that can also be TTF1 positive. So clinical history will be quite helpful in these types of cases. Um, but as you can see, they look just like uh, uh, colonic adenocarcinoma. Uh, you have hyperchromatic nuclei, very elongated look. Um, you often see necrosis. Here's some necrosis here on the top here. Um, uh, and they'll stain with uh, markers of colonic adenocarcinoma, SATB2, CDX2. Um, I don't have it here, but also will often stain with CK20, uh, may, may or may not stain with CK7 or TTF1. All right, so rushing right through. So a rare variant of adenocarcinoma is fetal adenocarcinoma. Um, I think this is one of those one of those tumors that you don't see very often, but is fairly testable. Um, you have both low-grade and high-grade fetal adenocarcinomas. There's a thought that they essentially uh, arise out of uh, different molecular pathways. Um, I think the low-grade one is what you're typically tested on. This has aberrant nuclear and cytoplasmic expression of beta-catenin. Uh, you can do an IHC for this, and um, they commonly will have CT TNNB1 mutations. Uh, DICER1 mutations have also been reported, but they're less common. Uh, in contrast, a high grade will have membranous uh, beta catenin expression rather than aberrant, uh, aberrant nuclear and cytoplasmic expression. Um, fetal adenocarcinoma is pretty distinctive. Uh, it has these uh, vacuoles, uh, supra and subnuclear vacuoles that kind of look like uh, piano keys almost. This is a low grade example. Um, high grade will look very similar, except you'll just have more cytologic atypia. Um, Here's another higher power example of a different case. Again, those beautiful uh, uh, vacuoles above and below the nuclei. When you're thinking about piano keys, think about fetal adenocarcinoma, think about beta catenin. Um, and then another distinctive feature will be squamous morials. Uh, and so this is another low grade example, um, but you can see you have these squamous morials right here. Okay, interspersed throughout. Uh, the vacuoles in this particular field aren't quite as distinctive, um, but if you look around uh, in this particular case, they were there. And these squamous morials can often be a clue that you're looking at uh, a fetal adenocarcinoma. And again, the squamous morials uh, typically are not present in the high grade uh, cases. All right. So we talked about um, mucinous, but I also wanted to uh, mention colloid adenocarcinoma. Now, these can be really challenging to diagnose. Um, because they look so similar to mucinous. But in contrast to mucinous, they're very slow growing. They're often incidental findings. They're gonna be unifocal. Um, I, I would never call a colloid adenocarcinoma if a patient had those histories that we were reporting for our mucinous cases with you know, multifocal lesions, you know, you know, looks like refractory pneumonia, the patient's doing really poorly. Um, but clinical history is helpful. Most of these cases I've seen, uh, again, very rare in actual clinical practice, but again, fair game for the boards. Uh, most of these cases I, I see are patient was in a car accident and an incidental two centimeter or 1.5 centimeter lesion is found in, in the lung. You know, or patient was being screened for something else and they found this small lesion. They've been following it for the past 10 years and now nah, it's kind of slowly growing a few millimeters and maybe they want to take a biopsy or maybe they want to wedge it out. Those are the kind of uh, clinical scenarios where you run into colloid adenocarcinoma. So here's a low power example of a colloid adenocarcinoma in its entirety. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a central scar with this one, but it's this kind of dissecting pools of mucin uh, that spread outwards. Uh, and, and on biopsy, they can be incredibly challenging because you may not get any of the tumor cells whatsoever. You just end up with mucin and little bits of uh, benign looking alveolar septa. In this particular field, you don't even see any of the mucin producing cells. Um, again, making biopsies challenging. Uh, here's a, another picture showing you uh, those mucin producing cells. They're often partially lining some of these uh, dissected spaces with all this mucin. Again, similar to mucinous adenocarcinoma uh, from colloid, they're going to have these basally oriented nuclei with abundant um, uh, mucin in the cytoplasm. So again, clinical history is key. And then if you're seeing it on a board exam, um, you know, they may show you a low power picture with that dissecting mucin kind of destroying the alveolar spaces. Um, those are the kind of key phrases and those key things that you're going to see. All right. Okay, so now completely switching gears to a very uh, poorly differentiated malignancy, let's talk about pleomorphic carcinomas. Okay, so pleomorphic carcinomas are poorly differentiated carcinomas. Um, they have two components. So they will have a non-small cell carcinoma component, and that component can consist of either adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma or large cell carcinoma. And I'll briefly mention large cell carcinoma later, but just as a as a review, large cell carcinoma is kind of a wastebasket term for a non-small cell carcinoma that doesn't have anything that makes it an adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma or a neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, so 
most often for pleomorphic carcinomas, the non-small cell component that you get is adenocarcinoma. Um, so you'll see this in combination with at least 10% of the tumor representing either spindled cells and or a malignant giant cells. Um, so since we've got a percentage on here, which again, I think could be potentially testable, um, you can't make a definitive diagnosis on a biopsy, right? So you can certainly suggest this on a biopsy, but you would need a resection in order to make definitive diagnosis. Maybe there was only two millimeters of spindled cells and it was all in the biopsy. And then the resection is like 99% Adeno conventional type adenocarcinoma uh, or squamous cell carcinoma. And then you wouldn't call that a pleomorphic carcinoma. Um, so if you had a biopsy, you'd say something like non-small cell carcinoma with spindle cell and or giant cell features. So here's an example from a resection of a pleomorphic carcinoma. So this one was actually uh, combined with uh, a squamous cell carcinoma on the top, which did stain with P40, and then a little bit more of these spindled cells in the bottom uh, that didn't stain with P40 or TTF1, but did have some patchy keratin staining. So you do want to see um, at least keratin staining uh, in uh, the spindled cell component. Um, and to keep in and uh, to mention as well that uh, pleomorphic carcinoma can also be in, composed entirely of spindle cells and or giant cells. Um, so here's an example of, so they don't, they don't have to have the adenocarcinoma component, right? So you can have the adenocarcinoma component plus at least 10% of spindled or giant cells, or they can just be pure spindle cell or pure giant cell. The pure giant cell ones are exceedingly rare. Um, you will probably never see one, uh, but the spindle cell ones are actually, I think, not uncommon. So here's an example of that, where you just have these kind of spindled cells. Uh, and here's an example of that giant cell carcinoma subtype. Um, so when you do have these cases where you have spindled cells, this poorly differentiated malignancy from the lung, um, do your keratins, uh, again, oftentimes they'll only be kind of patchy positive for keratins, maybe have a little CK7 positivity, um, maybe have TTF1, maybe not have TTF1. But if you get keratins and you rule out other things like um, a sarcomatoid mesothelioma, and then other poorly differentiated lesions, you can end up with this pleomorphic carcinoma diagnosis. All right, there's that giant cell subtype. It's very distinctive, but you almost never see it. Okay, so you may be wondering in your head, well, what about sarcomatoid carcinoma? So this is, um, unfortunately, in the, in the new WHO, uh, the terminology has changed a little bit. Um, sarcomatoid carcinoma is now considered an overarching term that encompasses pleomorphic carcinoma, which we just talked about, carcinosarcoma, and pulmonary blastoma, okay? So pleomorphic carcinoma, as I mentioned, it's uncommon, but you do see it. I think in particular, um, the combined adenocarcinoma and spindle cell and or basically a pure spindle cell lesion, that's not uncommon to see, although still rare in contrast with conventional type adenocarcinoma. Um, carcinosarcoma and pulmonary blastomas are very rare, but I think because of how distinctive they look, uh, potentially testable. Um, so for carcinosarcomas, you want to have a non-small cell carcinoma component. So this should be kind of familiar. Uh, it can be squame, uh, adenocarcinoma, or again, large cell, plus at, we at least one sarcomatous heterologous element. So a rhabdomyosarcoma, a chondrosarcoma, or an osteosarcoma. Um, and these will look just like their pure sarcoma counterparts. You'll just see this in addition uh, to a uh, a non-small cell carcinoma. Uh, and again, uh, similar to the pleomorphic carcinoma, you know, you'll have patchy keratin positivity, patchy TTF1 positivity, uh, and depending on your small biopsy, you may get nothing and then have to be descriptive and, and look for a resection. So here's an example of a carcinosarcoma. This was a combined uh, squamous cell carcinoma, this stained for P40 um, here in the center and some on the right. Um, and this this uh, patient also had uh, osteosarcoma and chondrosarcomatous elements. Um, here's uh, in, in, in varying levels of maturity, as you can see here with this more of this mixoid cartilaginous look here, but clearly uh, malignant cells. This is an example of a carcinosarcoma. And again, here a little bit more of that uh, immature uh, cartilaginous uh, formation. So pulmonary blastoma, again, it's also a biphasic uh, tumor. This one is a combination of a low-grade uh, fetal adenocarcinoma. So we talked about fetal adenocarcinoma before. So if you see fetal adenocarcinoma together with primitive mesenchymal stroma, then you can diagnose this as a pulmonary blastoma. Um, not to be confused with pleural pulmonary blastoma, which I'm not going to talk about today, but is which is a pediatric tumor. Uh, you know, for immunohistochemistry, again, keratins, TTF1, EMA should be at least patchy positive here and there. And then just like the fetal adeno, the pure fetal adenocarcinoma, you want to see cytoplasmic and nuclear expression of beta catenin in the fetal component. 
All right. Again, extremely rare, but has very unique um, uh, features, and so I think is is fair game for boards. So here's an example of a pulmonary blastoma. You can see these kind of primitive um, mesenchymal elements uh, in this field here. Okay. So let's talk about neuroendocrine lesions. So we have typical carcinoid tumors and atypical carcinoid tumors, and then our small cell carcinoma and our large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And you know what I uh, what I want to mention here, and I always like to mention this, is that these these tumors are not uh, con like carcinoid tumors are not considered pre-invasive lesions that are going to move into small cell carcinoma. You know, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma doesn't turn into small cell carcinoma. So these are all distinct tumors, um, and often with uh, different biological pathways on how they evolve. Um, there's some interesting molecular work going on. Again, a uh, little beyond the, uh, our talk today, but they don't um, progress to each other. So for typical carcinoid tumors, um, these are uh, characterized by uh, carcinoid morphology and then less than two mitoses per two millimeter squared. Again, I think this is a testable uh, point and no tumor necrosis. And then atypical carcinoid tumors will have two to 10 mitoses per two millimeter square and or tumor necrosis. So if you just see tumor necrosis, but you see only one mitotic figure per two millimeter squared, then it's uh, still an atypical carcinoid tumor. Uh, both typical and atypical carcinoid tumors can metastasize. I always like to, to mention that to folks. So just because you have a MET doesn't mean it can't be a carcinoid tumor. All right, but these are the diagnostic criteria and they're pretty ironclad. All right, uh, we'll show, I'll show you a picture here in a second, but I do wanna talk about small cell carcinoma. Um, this is really a histologic diagnosis, to be honest. Um, you don't actually even need to have positive neuroendocrine markers. And there are occasional cases that are negative for TGF1, negative for synaptophysa, negative for chromogranin, negative for INSM1, negative for CD56, um, but they look like small cell and they're essentially located lesion in a smoker. Small cell carcinoma, done. Um, they usually do stay with neuroendocrine markers and they usually do stain with TTF1, but I always wanna point that out because I think it's an important um, thing to remember that small cell carcinoma is still fundamentally considered a histologic diagnosis. Um, they have that very distinctive nuclear molding, crush artifact. The mitotic index is gonna be very high, typically greater than 95%, usually approaching 100%. Uh, large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas, um, you're going to see more cytoplasm here in contrast to small cell, which you essentially should see none. If you think about small cell carcinomas, your main differential is really a lymphoma, right? Because there's hardly any um, uh, cytoplasm in these cells and they can mimic what you see in uh, lymphocytes. Uh, but large cell will have uh, nests of cells with peripheral palisading, prominent nucleoli, and unlike small cell, you do need to have at least one neuroendocrine uh, marker positive for large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. So here's an example of a typical carcinoid tumor. So you can see this kind of salt and pepper uh, chromatin, very classic neuroendocrine feature, uh, forming these tiny little nests uh, here and there, no mitotic figures, uh, no uh, tumor necrosis. And I should mention as well, um, when you are counting mitotic figures, it really is an average. So if you're able to find one field in 100 that has two figures, but there's like zero everywhere else, don't call it an atypical carcinoid tumor. Um, all right, so here's an example of an atypical carcinoid tumor. Um, again, you see some nest of cells, a little bit of neuroendocrine features here, uh, and then tumor necrosis here in the center. All right, so this one is just given away by its tumor necrosis. Uh, you can have single cell tumor necrosis as well. Here's a small cell carcinoma. Again, very little cytoplasm. Uh, the cells kind of uh, mold against each other, very hyperchromatic. Um, you know, small cell is pretty distinctive. Uh, this would be positive for synaptochromo TTF1 in most cases and have a proliferative index of greater than 95%. In contrast, this is an example of large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Again, there's some tumor necrosis here, but this is beyond what would be acceptable um, for atypia in a uh, carcinoid tumor. You can see this uh, peripheral palisading as well. Okay, so so that's a, a distinctive feature for large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma is peripheral palisading. Uh, you know, in cases like this, I'll commonly do uh, TTF, P40, uh, synaptochromo, uh, and, you know, amib. Um, you know, large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas tend to have a little bit lower proliferative index in contrast to small cells. Sometimes on small biopsies, it can be challenging to differentiate between the two. You might say, ah, is this too much cytoplasm? Is it a, not enough cytoplasm? Is there some peripheral palisading? Hard to say. Um, sometimes a proliferative index can actually be helpful there because a large cell tends to be more like 50 to 80 percent. Now, of course, there's overlap. You have small cells that are 75, 80 percent, and that's fine. Um, but if you have something that's like 40, 50 percent proliferative index, that's really unlikely to be a small cell carcinoma. And you really want to think more of a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma.
Um, proliferative index can also be helpful in small crushed biopsies with neuroendocrine cells that you may think is a small cell, but in fact is a carcinoid tumor. So if you do your KI-67 and it comes back with a proliferative index of 1%, don't call that a small cell carcinoma. All right. So even though it's not required for diagnosis, I highly recommend anytime you have a neuroendocrine lesion uh, to run a, a KI-67 or a MIB-1. Okay. So my mouth is getting dry here. Okay, let's talk about some rare tumors. Like these are just kind of lumped together. They're not actually related to each other. Um, I want to talk about a few salivary gland tumors. I mentioned large cell carcinoma, nut carcinoma, and smart 4 deficient tumor. Okay, so always keep in mind they're rare, but because of the serumucinous glands that sit in your proximal airways, all salivary gland tumors can be primary in the lung. Now, of course, anytime you see a salivary gland tumor in the lung, you're gonna first thing you're gonna do, hopefully, uh, is look to see if the patient has a primary in their actual salivary gland. Since, of course, salivary gland tumors are more common in salivary glands, and metastases are more common than primary. Um, but to keep in mind that you can find every single salivary gland tumor arising primarily uh, in the lung. They're just very rare. The most common one that you see is mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Um, of the salivary gland tumors that arise in the lung, this is by far and above the most common of these rare tumors. Um, this is followed by adenoid cystic, although again, uh, metastatic adenoid cystic is also much more common than a primary adenoid cystic. Uh, you know, this is a common actually behavior of adenoid cystic from the salivary gland. They'll form multiple cannonball lesions in the lung and just sit there, sometimes for years. Um, but if you have one primary, uh, 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 proximal lesion, it could be primary. A cynic cell, I'm not going to talk about that, but it can sh uh, come up in the lung as well as all the other ones. I also want to mention hyalinizing clear cell carcinoma um, because I think it does have some testable uh, components to it. So mucoepidermoid carcinoma, uh, as I mentioned, originates from the serumucinous glands in the proximal airways, um, is the most common salivary gland lesion to be seen primary in the lung. Tend to see it in patients younger than 30. Um, it has a distinctive uh, CRTC1 mammal 2 fusion, and we can test this by fish for mammal 2. So this, I think, is the really big testable comment, I, uh, testable uh, fact. I can see them showing you a picture of a mucoep and saying, what fish test would you want to do for this tumor? Mammal 2. All right. Uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma the primary differential, I um, have to put a little real life in here, our primary differential is going to be adenosquame. Um, adenosquame tends to be uh, seen in older patients and tends to have higher cytologic features. Mucoepidermoid carcinoma can be low or high grade. They're almost always low grade in the lung. Very, very rarely will you see high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma in the lung. And the high grade, of course, are less likely to have the mammal 2 uh, fusion just to make things more complicated. But we will leave that aside for now. Uh, the three cell types from mucoepidermoid carcinoma are the squamoid or epidermoid cells, your mucin uh, secreting cells, and then the so-called intermediate cells. Uh, these are the hardest to identify, but really what you're looking for is squamoid without keratinization and mucin. Uh, so here's an example of uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma. They often have these uh, variably sized cystic spaces. You can see up in the right here, there are some squamoid looking cells, that kind of dense eosinophilic cytoplasm that you see with uh, squamoid lesions, but no actual keratinization. And then interspersed throughout are these mucin producing cells. You can see this mucin, if you were to do a mucicarmine stain, um, sometimes if you're not sure if they're mucin producing cells, you can throw a mucicarmine on there. But usually you can tell on H&E, they have this distinctive uh, grayish look in the cytoplasm. Uh, and then these are actually, I, I chose this picture because I think it has a good example of these so-called intermediate cells. So these are the cells in between here. These actually have some clearing. They don't always, but they don't really look squamoid and they don't really look mucin. They're just these meh, intermediate cells. So I think they're very aptly named. Um, so this is an example of a low-grade um, mucoepidermoid carcinoma. And this did actually have a mammal too, uh, a fish. All right, so I'm not gonna go into adenoid cystic and acinic cell, but I did wanna talk about hyalinizing clear cell carcinoma. So this is rare, but it does can arise in the lung. They're typically gonna be endobronchial. They have a characteristic EWSR1 ATF1 fusion, and this has been present in all cases. So this is your testable fact, EWSR1 ATF1. Uh, ATF1 fusion. Um, they're pretty characteristic. Uh, you know, as the name implies, they have variable amounts of uh, clear and, uh, clearing around their cells as well as eosinophilic cells. And then they have this very distinctive uh, hyalinized uh, stroma. And these will stain with P40. And so that's the, I think, the pitfall in these cases. If you look at it and you don't look closely, you just do a P40 and you just call it a squamous cell carcinoma and you're done. Um, and they have a little bit uh, better prognosis in squamous cell carcinoma. So you don't, you don't want to miss this one. And remember that uh, characteristic uh, mutation. Okay, so large cell carcinoma, um, I have uh, referenced this uh, before, but I'll talk about it again. 
poorly differentiated malignancy. Um, this is kind of a wastebasket diagnosis. You should essentially not be making this diagnosis. Maybe once a year or once every couple of years do I actually make this diagnosis uh, even on our consult surface. So it really, you really usually can find something that pushes you towards a more definitive diagnosis. So essentially to call something large cell carcinoma, not to be confused with large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, which is a completely different entity with neuroendocrine uh, features and that peripheral palisading and neuroendocrine uh, markers like we talked about. Um, these can't have any morphologic, so they can't have any squamous features, they can't have any uh, glandular formation, they can't have any immunohistochemical, so no TTF1, no P40, or molecular results, so EGFR mutation, uh, for example, to support a line of differentiation. So they can't have anything that makes you think it's adenocarcinoma, you know, TTF1 must be negative, you can't have mucin, um, nothing to make you think squamous cell carcinoma, P40 should be negative, um, you, you shouldn't see uh, squam you know, keratinization, of course, and then you shouldn't see any neuroendocrine features. Don't do neuroendocrine markers on these on these cases. They shouldn't have any neuroendocrine morphologic features, so don't do the stains, um, because some, some things that are large cell carcinoma without uh, morphologic features of uh, without neuroendocrine morphologic features may have some patchy um, uh, marker, uh, patchy staining for synaptophysin or chromogranin. It doesn't mean anything. They should be keratin positive. You want to prove that it's a carcinoma, right? And you're not misdiagnosing a melanoma or lymphoma or mesothelioma, of course. So you are going to have some keratins that need to be positive in order to call it a carcinoma, but nothing else should be positive. All right. So here's an example, kind of nondescript, ugly looking cells. This one has a kind of a brisk uh, lymphocytic uh, infiltrate in the background, but stain negative for everything. Nothing showed up on molecular, uh, just some patchy uh, keratin staining. Okay, so nut carcinoma. I think this is, again, something that uh, is quite testable. It's an aggressive form of squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, it's uh, distinguished by rearrangement in the nut one gene. So of course you need to know that. Uh, thankfully though, it's in the name. So this one's easy to remember. Um, you can see them in the lung. We also see them in the head and neck. They're not specific to the lung. You see relatively monomorphic sheets of cells. They can be epithelioid. They can be kind of spindled. About a third of cases, if and if you're lucky, your case will have this, will show abrupt keratinization which may make you think about a nut carcinoma, um, they can have nonspecific staining with neuroendocrine markers, which again can lead you down the wrong pathway, which goes back to my point, which is don't do neuroendocrine markers if you don't see neuroendocrine features. So here's an example of a nut carcinoma, kind of monomorphic looking, um, sort of nondescript. You know, when I see cases like this in the lung with uh, these, they're sort of poorly differentiated. I don't see, you know, adenocarcinoma features. I don't see squamous features per se, um, kind of discohesive. There's some prominent nucleoli. You know, I'm going to think about a nut carcinoma. I'm going to think about a SMARC A4 uh, undifferentiated thoracic tumor. Um, I might even think about an epithelioid sarcoma. Uh, so those are things you might think about in a case like this. But your nut stain, there's a little bit higher power of that. These the prominent nucleoli here. Of course, you want to rule out things like melanoma. Um, uh, nut stain will be positive, confirming your diagnosis. So when I get these poorly differentiated, but vaguely monomorphic looking uh, undifferentiated malignancies, um, I oftentimes my standard panel after TTF and P40 and keratins will be a nut, a BRG1, and an INI1. Okay, which leads us nicely to the thoracic smart a 4 deficient undifferentiated tumor. It's kind of a mouthful. I just think of smart a 4 deficient tumors. Um, so these are undifferentiated they're high grade, they're often rhabdoid. You're gonna see these in older men who smoke. That's gonna be your standard. Uh, although of course there's been a wide range reported in the literature. Uh, these are defined by the loss of smart a 4 and the protein is BRG1. So again, this is super testable, I think. Um, so remember SMARC-A4 and then your protein, your IHC that you're going to do is actually going to be for BRG1. It's a member of the SWE SNF chromatin remodeling complex. Immunohistochemistry can be very confusing in these cases. They have variable staining for a whole host of things, including keratins, um, vascular markers, uh, SOX10, SAL4, synaptophysin. And again, you can also have some staining, a little bit patchy staining with TTF1, P40, even WT1, so you might be thinking about mesothelioma, squame, adenocarcinoma, neuroendocrine lesions. You can really go down the tubes on these cases. Um, so the key is to look for these high-grade malignancies. If you see rhabdoid features, sometimes discohesion, um, think to do that BRG1 stain. So here's an example of that. These are kind of ugly looking cells. Uh, here's another field showing you a bit more of this rhabdoid look, kind of discohesive. 
All right, here's a different case again, uh, sort of discohesive, vaguely monomorphic, but kind of ugly looking cells uh, with these rhabdoid uh, features here. Uh, and then when you do your uh, stain, so um, Claudin-4 is, an, is, of course, a marker for uh, epithelial cells. Uh, this, this would be a marker for carcinoma, is uh, always going to be negative, even though you may get patchy staining with other uh, keratins. And then that BRG1 is going to be your clincher for your diagnosis. Um, so the cells that you're seeing staining are actually lymphocytes, which serve as a beautiful internal control, but the tumor cells are negative. So it's loss of staining. So it's loss of staining with BRG1 that will make this diagnosis. OK. So now again, we're going to get whiplash again and <laughs> we whiplash again and move back to some mesenchymal lesions, which again, I think are quite testable. You need to know them. Um, pulmonary hamartomas. So these are neoplastic lesions. Um, they're almost always benign. Malignant transformation has been reported, but super, super rare. So consider pulmonary hamartomas as benign lesions. They have a high frequency of a translocation um, leading to an HMGA2 LPP fusion gene. Again, this may be testable fodder here. Um, pulmonary hamartomas, they're actually pretty common, and they're distinguished by having two mesenchymal elements together with entrapped, often metaplastic respiratory epithelium. And those mesenchymal elements can be chondroid, chondromyxoid, adipose, connective tissue, smooth muscle, or even bone. Uh, most commonly, you'll see the chondromyxoid material or fat. Um, that's going to be your most common thing. So here's a low power of a pulmonary hamartoma. And these are the cases that typically radiology will find on imaging. They're often called popcorn lesions because they can find the cartilage in these lesions. Okay, and you can see some entrapped respiratory epithelium even at this low power. You can see some entrapped fat here, and of course, lots of cartilage. All right, so here's all your elements, fat, cartilage, entrapped respiratory epithelium. Uh, sometimes they're not quite as obvious. So again, here's some chondromyxoid material with some fat. Uh, there's some respiratory here. So they can look a little funny. Sometimes they can even be a little cystic, but that's pretty rare. All right, here's that chondromyxoid material. Again, you want to look closely and make sure you're not missing an actual sarcoma. Um, and again, there's nothing here that, that would make you think about a sarcoma. Here's a biopsy, um, because I think these can be challenging. Uh, as you often see mature cartilage in pulmonary hamartomas, just like you see benign mature cartilage in proximal airways. And so sometimes you may get a biopsy that only shows you mature cartilage and that clinician wants to know, is this a hamartoma? You can't definitively say yes. Now, if you start to see some chondromyxoid tissue, that can be actually more helpful than what you're looking at is, in fact, a pulmonary hamartoma. Here's another uh, a spot from that same biopsy showing you some admixed mature adipose tissue, again, helping to clinch that diagnosis. So pitfalls, like I mentioned, fragments of benign airway, you want to correlate with imaging clinical history, be descriptive. Uh, your primary differential is a chondroma. And again, I think this is something that is pretty rarely seen, but I think fairly testable, and you'll see why here in a second. It's because of this Carney triad. Uh, you know, boards love to test you on things like that. So and chondromas are going to be cartilage only, as the name implies. I'll show you a picture here in a second. Um, but they're typically associated with Carney triad. Uh, and females younger than 30 uh, when they're seen with a Carney triad. And your Carney triad is uh, your gist, your gastrointestinal stromal tumors, the pulmonary chondromas, of course, and paragangliomas. So again, all, all super testable. Uh, keep this in your brain. Um, chondromas are not going to have that entrapped respiratory epithelium. They're really pretty rare, uh, and they're only going to be cartilage. In contrast to the hamartomas, um, you want to see multiple mesenchymal components. They're usually sporadic and random. Um, you tend to see them in older patients, and you'll, of course, see entrapped respiratory epithelium. So here's an example of a chondroma. It's just cartilage. All right, this is some, um, uh, you might think, well, yeah, what about the fat right there? This is actually bone and bone marrow inside the fat. Um, so it's not, not the, the perfect example, but this actually is a true chondroma in a patient that actually had Carney triad. All right, and there's your cartilage. Again, always look on high power. Make sure you don't see any uh, features of a chondrosarcoma. You don't want to miss that, of course. Okay, so another uh, tumor. So this is, again, uh, kind of a, a, an adenoma type thing. So this is a sclerosing pneumocytoma. This previously was called a sclerosing uh, hemangioma. It's of pneumocyte origin, hence the change of the, no the name from a sclerosing hemangioma. It's called hemangioma because it has large blood lakes, and I'll look at an example of that in a second. Um, but now we know it comes from pneumocytes, lots of histologic patterns, which can make diagnosis challenging, papillary, hemorrhagic. It can be scler sclerotic. They can be solid, but they should have low proliferative index. Most are benign. Uh, rare cases have shown METs, um, and they have AKT1 mutations in most cases. Not required for diagnosis, but since this is a board, a board review lecture, um, something to keep in mind. So 
the, the interesting features of sclerosing pneumocytomas is they have these, these two cell populations. They have round cells on the surface and then stromal cells uh, underneath the round cells. And they have a, a, a variable staining pattern. So the stromal cells will be negative for keratin versus the round cells will be positive. Stromal cells will be positive for uh, progesterone receptor or PR and negative in those round cells. Both EMA and TTF1 will be positive in both cell populations. So you could essentially do um, a TTF1 and a pan-keratin or a TTF1 and a PR uh, to, to show that dual population. You don't have to do all four of these stains. Um, so here's a low power view of a sclerosing pneumocytoma. They're pretty well circumscribed, but not encapsulated lesions. Uh, here's one with a papillary pattern. There's some sclerosis. They don't have true fibrovascular cores, um, but this kind of complex uh, branching looks, sort of a papillary look. A little bit higher power there. There's some sclerosis. And you can see even on this power, you can see those round cells on the surface and then additional cells in below. And Usually what happens with these cases is you'll do a keratin or a TTF1 and you'll be like, wait, why is a TTF1 staining all of these cells in the interstitium? That's not normal if you're thinking about like a papillary adenocarcinoma or something like that. Um, so here's another example that's more solid. Again, surface cells a little bit different than the rounder cells underneath. All right. Yet another example. Here's the staining of the uh, PR. So you can see those surface cells are nicely negative and then all those stromal cells underneath are staining uh, positive. Here's that EMA, where you have staining in both the surface cells and the stromal cells. All right. And then here's an example showing you some hemosiderin. You can think, you can imagine why this used to, used to be called a hemangioma. All right. And you can see some foamy macrophages there. And a little bit of atypia is all right. Just low power, hemangioma, uh, <laughs> uh, previous name. Okay. All right, so another adenoma that you need to be aware of, this is uh, new in the 2021 WHO, which is not that new because now it's 2023, so I think fair game for your boards, is a bronchiolar adenoma or a ciliated muconodulary papillary tumor. Um, CMPT is sort of the older name. Um, the newer name that we're moving towards is bronchiolar adenoma. These are going to be seen in a peribronchial location typically. They're incidental findings, slow growing, so similar to that colloid um, uh, carcinoma that I showed you, these are often incidentally found. And they often have BRAF mutations. So remember, BRAF mutations um, can be seen in bronchiolar adenomas. Okay. So these are bilayered lesions. So you have your luminal cells, which can be a mucus or ciliated. Um, or they can resemble type 2 pneumocytes. And so the reason I, I put this on here is just for actual diagnostic purposes. Um, in terms of top line, you can just call all of these bronchiolar adenoma and be done with it. Um, but to keep in mind that um, those luminal cells may look more like type 2 pneumocytes or club cells, and those are the distal type. They think they're just mimicking the distal type pneumocytes, or we have the so-called proximal type or classical ciliated mucinodulary papillary tumor. They can have mucus containing cells and ciliated cells. Um, so that's really only for diagnostic purposes, not so much for needing to put that on the top line. Um, but the key feature is a continuous basal cell layer. Uh, and you know, anytime you see a continuous basal cell layer, you're going to want to think about a benign process, right? All right. And of course, just to make things more complicated, there can be morphologic overlap. Um, so here's an example of that proximal type of a uh, bronchiolar adenoma, or the, the ciliated mucinodulary papillary tumor. You can see that you have cilia, and it's hard to see the cilia in this power, but you can definitely see you have mucin uh, secreting cells. And you might think, well, how do I tell this apart from a mucinous adenocarcinoma? Because it sure looks like that mucinous adenocarcinoma that I showed you earlier, right? Apical mucin, bland, basally oriented nuclei. Uh, how are you going to get out of this trick? Well, P40 is going to get you out of that trick because mucinous adenocarcinoma is not going to have a continuous basal cell layer and uh, bronchiolar adenomas will. So P40 will be your helpful uh, here. Uh, sometimes I've had cases where I do a P40 and it turns out to be negative. And then uh, the person who sent me the consult asked me, why on earth did you do a P40? This doesn't look anything like a squamous cell carcinoma. And it's like, in fact, we did it to look for a basal cell layer. It can really help you out. And here's high power of that same case showing you those nice little cilia. You don't always see the cilia, but when you do, they're super helpful. All right, so here's a distal type case. Again, you know, this sort of discrete lesion incidentally discovered they took it out because they didn't know what it was. Um, and uh, it has, uh, doesn't have those cilia. It has this um, more distal type pneumocyte kind of flat sort of very nondescript could be adenocarcinoma type cells, but again, had an intact uh, P40 basal cell layer uh, on that case. Okay, so you have to think about it. Clinical history can be helpful.
All right, so now let's talk about some pleural lesions. So mesothelioma, I could give an entire hour talk on mesothelioma, and in fact, I have given entire hour talks on mesotheliomas, um, but I wanna give you some really, really basic stuff here uh, just to help with any questions you might get on your boards. So mesotheliomas are broken down into epithelioid, sarcomatoid, and biphasic. Biphasics are combinations of epithelioid and sarcomatoid. Epithelioids are now further uh, subsplit into high grade and low grade based off of a, a grading system, which I don't believe Believe you would be tested on. Um, but I think just being able to recognize an epithelioid mesothelioma is helpful. So mesothelioma diagnoses uh, tend to be a immunohistochemical game, uh, so to speak, unlike mucinous adenocarcinomas. Uh, you have to do at least two stains from the mesothelial pile and the epithelial pile. Uh, my warning for this is that the mesothelial markers tell you that cells are of mesothelial origin. They don't tell you that they're malignant. So completely benign mesothelial cells will also be positive for calretinin, D240, WT1, CK56. Um, so you wanna have other features of malignancy to tell you something is truly a mesothelioma versus not. Um, and then your epithelial markers, uh, TTF1, Claudin4, uh, Mach31 and Berry P4 are essentially the same thing. So I usually just do one of them. Um, uh, polyclonal CEA is another marker you can use. It tends to be a little bit dirtier. Uh, my favorite markers are TTF and Claudin4 four, and then um, these are good mesothelial markers. So what about pankeratin? It's not going to differentiate between a carcinoma and a mesothelioma, um, but it is very useful to assess architecture and invasion. So when we talk about mesothelioma, uh, you know, you want to look for tumefactive uh, growth, so large just chunks of tumor cells, uh, chunks of mesothelial cells really shouldn't form sheets. That's not a normal reactive process. You want to look for invasion into the fat, invasion into lung. Um, that's going to be diagnostic of a mesothelioma. Um, so what if your question is a different question though, right? So we just talked about the stains, which help differentiate between mesothelioma versus a carcinoma. And that's when you're sure what you're looking at is a malignant process. But sometimes you're not sure if you're looking at benign reactive mesothelial cells versus malignant mesothelial cells. And as I mentioned, those, those IHCs are not going to help you. This is where loss of BAP1 and or MTAP by IHC can be really helpful. Or you can do FISH for CDK and 2A um, to look for homozygous deletion. These, I think, are very testable. So if you see loss of BAP1 or MTAP or CDK and 2A homozygous deletion by FISH, that's going to help tell you that you're looking at malignant mesothelial cells and a mesothelioma. Um, and just of note, the MTAP is actually a surrogate for the CDK uh, and 2A uh, FISH. So I, I essentially never do the FISH. It's kind of falling a little bit out of favor now that we have the MTAP IHC um, together uh, with BAP1 can be quite useful. All right. Um, so to keep in mind, BAP1 loss tells you that something is uh, going to be malignant, um, uh, almost without doubt, but BAP retention doesn't tell you it's benign. A huge percentage of mesotheliomas will actually have retained BAP1. So it's helpful if it's lost, but not helpful if it's retained. All right. And then uh, this is just that CDK and 2A percentages that you'll see them um, in uh, some epithelioid uh, mesotheliomas and then actually a large amount of sarcomatous, uh, sarcomatous mesotheliomas. So here's an example of an epithelioid mesothelioma. Okay. So as the name implies, epithelioid mesos are going to have epithelioid cells. This is a trabecular pattern. Uh, again, I don't have time to show you the 5 million patterns that mesotheliomas can have, but basically mesotheliomas are kind of like melanomas in that they can look like anything. They can be glandular, they can be solid, they can be papillary, they can be trabecular, they can be adenomatoid, they can look like small cell carcinoma. Like they, they, are, it's a, it's a great mimicker. Um, but usually, your standard epithelial meso is going to have these very monomorphic looking cells. Um, and this is another uh, tip for mesothelioma diagnosis. Reactive mesothelial cells tend to be atypical. Mesotheliomas, epithelioid mesotheliomas, actually tend to look very very uh, monomorphic and very bland. Uh, here's an example where you might wonder, you know, is this just reactive right here? But then if you look down here and you do a keratin, you can see that the cells are actually dripping down and invading into the adipose tissue. Done. Malignant mesothelioma. Uh, this is a calretinin stain. Um, so look for those invasion. If you see mesothelial cells in the lung, invasion. Done. Mesothelioma. Even if it's a small focus, you shouldn't see that. All right. Um, so this is just my standard uh, panel for sarcomatoid mesotheliomas. So we just talked about epithelioid mesotheliomas. A lot of those markers don't help you for sarcomatoid mesotheliomas. Um, they look like the sarcomatoid carcinoma that I showed you earlier, those spindle cell carcinoma. They can look just like that. Um, 
but they won't they all sometimes they will stain with mesothelial markers like calretinin D240WT1, but they often don't. GATA3 can be a very helpful marker in this uh, in, in this uh, situation specifically. You know, of course, GATA3 is not specific for mesothelioma. You know, you also see it in breast and bladder and other places, uh, and as well as uh, primary lung adenocarcinoma. Um, but in a sarcomatoid lesion, strong GATA3 staining uh, would favor a sarcomatoid mesothelioma. Keratin can be helpful again for architecture and invasion. And of course, uh, your epithelial markers are still uh, useful here. If you have staining for TTF1 or keratins or clot in 4, you're going to want to call that a spindle cell uh, pleomorphic, uh, car uh, pleomorphic carcinoma, the sarcomatoid carcinoma. So uh, here's an example here of these sort of nondescript spindled cells with this abnormal architecture. You can see they're, they're, they're forming at different, uh, different levels. All right, this is sarcomatoid carcinoma. All right, I wish I had more time to talk about meso, but I don't have much. I did want to make a quick note about desmoplastic mesothelioma. It's my hope they wouldn't test you this on board. That would be kind of a cruel question, but of course, everything is fair game. Uh, these tend to be very bland uh, spindled cells. You're not going to see atypia here, often hypocellular. Look for tumor necrosis, especially bland infarct tumor necrosis and abrupt changes in cellularity. And of course, as with all versions, uh, all flavors of mesothelioma, invasion into fat or the lung parenchyma tells you it's malignant. Um, so here's an example of a desmoplastic mesothelioma. Um, and hopefully this should scare you because it certainly scared me the first time I saw one of these cases. Super bland looking case. All right. Okay. So biphasic, you have to have at least 10% of each component. So biphasics are combinations of sarcomatoid and epithelioid. And then a percentage of each should be reported in resection uh, specimens. Uh, here's an example of a biphasic with more epithelioid on the left, tumor necrosis there, and spindled on the right. And you want all your stains to... to to be uh, what they should be. Okay, so super brief mesothelioma uh, overview. So the other pleural-based lesion that you want to be able to identify is solitary fibrous tumor. They're pretty rare. Um, it's a fibroblastic neoplasm. Remember STAT6, all right? So you don't have to, they're also positive uh, for uh, CD34, um, uh, but uh, remember STAT6, that's going to be pathognomonic for um, SFTs. SFTs can be malignant. Uh, they typically behave in a benign fashion. Um, there is a whole grading scheme and criteria for these, uh, but I doubt you would be tested on that on your boards. I think just being able to recognize a solitary fibrous tumor. They can be epithelioid like this one is, a little more, or spindled. They often have some you know, little bits of collagen fibrosis in the background, and STAT6 stat will be your stain. All right? Okay. So moving right along to talk about picomatous tumors. So I'm going to talk about lymphangiomyomatosis or LAM, and as well as just a straight up picoma or a little sugar tumor in the lung. Um, so LAM is an uncommon cystic lung disease. You almost exclusively see it in women. I have yet to see a case in a man. Um, they typically are identified uh, uh, during the childbearing age uh, for women. They're part of the picomatous family of neoplasms, think angiomyolipomas and things like that. They, they can occur spontaneously. You can't just have LAM and nothing else, or you could have them as part of the tuber sclerosis complex. So I think that's a testable um, thing, tuber sclerosis complex in a woman um, and LAM. Uh, on imaging, you'll see variably sized bilateral cysts, and the distinctive histologic feature, or distinctive immunophenotypic features, are they have this myomelanocytic phenotype, and you'll also see this in other picoma family uh, tumors. So they'll stain uh, with both uh, melanocytic as well as uh, smooth muscle markers. So SMA, Desmond. And then HMP45, MART1, uh, MIT-F. Uh, they'll also stain with ER and PR, although I typically don't use these stains. Um, and they should be negative for keratins, OK? So here's an example of a patient with LAM. Um, you can see that she has this large cystic space here. And then you look for these uh, little uh, collections of cells in the walls of these cystic spaces. So here's one here. Here's another one here, variably sized. So you can see these uh, LAM cells, so to speak, with that myomelanocytic phenotype, which I'll show you in a second here. They have this a little bit of a stretched out shape, but still kind of um, uh, tapered, not tapered, but uh, rounded on the end, more like you see in, in, in uh, muscle cells in contrast to neural cells, okay? All right, and then and they can form little nodules, little knots right there. So usually if you get one of these, you're like, oh yeah, yeah it's good, it's LAM, but sometimes they're a little more subtle, just the thickening of the wall of the cyst. So here's HMB45. And here's SMA. So that distinct uh, phenotype will tell you that you're looking at um, uh, a LAM case. 
sopacomas, uh, very similar, except they're just going to form a tumor rather than a, 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 a cystic process. Um, these cells are derived from perivascular epithelial cells. They're again in that same family with angiomyolipomas and LAM, typically peripheral, solitary, very rare tumor, same myomelanocytic phenotype. Um, here's an example of a pacomatous tumor. They often have clearing of the cells. Um, they've been called sugar tumors in the past. And um, there is your uh, SMA, and then there's your HMB45. Uh, something I will note as just a tip for these uh, picomatous tumors, oftentimes the melanocytic markers uh, are focal and not all melanocytic markers will stain. So if you are convinced something is a pacoma or a patient has LAM and you do one a melanocytic marker and it's negative, do all of them because you'll likely find one uh, that is positive. Um, you, the smooth muscle markers are never a problem. They always stain very strong and, and positive. Okay, so that was a whirlwind through uh, neoplastic pathology. So now I'm going to touch on a few topics in non-neoplastic pathology. I want to talk about acute lung injury. Uh, very basics of a few interstitial lung diseases, uh, a few infectious agents just for uh, pictures, and then a few other topics, uh, systemic uh, vasculitic syndromes, GPA and EGPA, as well as aspiration, because I can't not talk about aspiration. Okay, so organizing pneumonia, it's a nonspecific form of uh, lung injury and repair. It consists of mucopolysaccharide-rich plugs of proliferating fibroblasts in your alveolar spaces and your distal bronchioles. Um, the etiology is broad, infection, drug reactions, aspiration, autoimmune disease associated with interstitial lung diseases, noxious inhalants, vaping, you know, you were in a fire, uh, or just cryptogenic, so COP, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. So essentially, anything that can damage the lung can cause organizing pneumonia. Um, I think about acute and subacute lung injury uh, in that your body can respond to injury in only so many ways, right? If you cut yourself, whether it's with a knife or a blade or a sharp piece of glass, like your, your injury and your repair, your response is going to be the same, right? And it's similar uh, in, your, in your lung. So here's an example of organizing pneumonia. You should definitely be able to recognize this. Uh, this is a fibroblastic plug, um, or the old term is Masson body. Hopefully you won't see that term on your boards, but considering some of the pictures I saw on my boards, you might. <laughs> um, so this is a fibroblastic plug. Um, so this is filling the alveolar space together with a lot of macrophages in this particular case. This is in contrast to the fibroblastic focus that I'll talk about in a minute that you see in an interstitial lung disease, usual interstitial pneumonia. So don't confuse the two. Um, and uh, here's a fibroblastic plug in a distal bronchial. All right. And this one actually has some inflammatory cells trapped inside of it. Uh, this patient was probably aspirating. All right, here's organizing pneumonia in a smoker. A little bit easier to see that it's their plugs filling the spaces. You know, they can branch out and fill those alveolar ducts as well. So you can get some pretty uh, funny patterns with this organizing pneumonia, um, but it has that sort of mixoid look to it, this kind of light blue color, and you see the fibroblasts admixed in it. All right, and again, can be due to any number of, of causes. All right, here's really high power showing you a little fibroblastic plug uh, in a needle core biopsy. Okay. Here's an example showing you organizing pneumonia adjacent to cancer. So some squamous cell carcinoma on the upper right weren't just done with the neoplastic yet. Okay, so you can see it with anything. All right, so now the more severe form of uh, lung injury is diffuse alveolar damage. And this is a histologic counterpart in most all cases to acute respiratory distress syndrome. So these are your patients that are crashing in the ICU, often on ventilators, they're doing very, very poorly. Um, this is nonspecific pattern, just like organizing pneumonia. And again, the etiology is broad, um, but in addition to infection, drug, underlying connective tissue diseases, we're adding in alveolar hemorrhage syndromes, um, inhalants, sepsis, uh, sepsis, shock, can be idiopathic. So the idiopathic version of organizing pneumonia is called COP or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. And the idiopathic version of DAD is called acute interstitial pneumonia because we need more terminology. I feel like I need to apologize for the non-neoplastic terminology, um, even though I didn't make it up, or Hammond Rich syndrome, a very old term. Okay, so essentially anything that can severely damage the lung can cause diffuse alveolar damage. All right, so there are some phases of diffuse alveolar damage. First, you have the so-called exudative phase where you get edema and fibrin. Uh, then you move into the transition to where you get hyaline membranes, which are uh, collections of uh, that fibrin and cellular debris, um, and they approximate the alveolar spaces in these bright pink bands. And then you get more inflammation that comes in across all of this, and then you can get organization fibroplasia at the end. All right, and DAD can progress to fibrosis. It can, uh, that can be stable um, or not. It can get 
it can keep getting worse and worse and worse, which we see in some of our COVID patients, or it can just be stable fibrosis. Uh, I apologize, it's spelled wrong, or it can actually resolve completely and you've recovered. Um, so depending on where you do your biopsies, you're likely going to see a mixture of any of these processes. Um, because if you think about it, uh, whatever the uh, uh, inciting event is, unless it happened once in like a very short period and then stopped, uh, and you see this very stable progression, usually it's if it's because of an infection, you're gonna stay infected for a while. So you're gonna see all these features oftentimes in a biopsy. All right, so here's an example of DAD on day one, just a little bit of fibrin accumulating here, just maybe a few neutrophils. Day four, you're starting to get hyaline membranes. Be able to recognize hyaline membranes. This is definitely, I actually had, a, I remember distinctly I had a question on my boards and the whole point of the question was being able to recognize hyaline membranes as part of diffuse alveolar damage. So there are these bright pink, it's like someone took a bright pink highlighter and just drew uh, around the, the alveolar spaces. So be able to recognize these. And then here's day seven where you're getting some, still some remnant hyaline membranes, but you're starting to see this organizing fibroplasia, which can mimic organizing pneumonia, but the background is gonna show you hyaline membranes, diffuse alveolar septal widening, you know, markedly atypical pneumocytes. It's going to be a much worse picture than what you typically will see in organizing pneumonia. So this is all the same disease. Even though we have these categories of, of how, we, how we, we grade it, it's all diffuse alveolar damage. All right. Um, so here are some of the histologic features that we think about that can help you with etiology. Because recognizing that it's DAD or OP isn't enough. You need to try to come up with an etiology, if you can, to help your clinician. So necrosis, neutrophils, viral cytopathic effects, necrotizing granulomas, those are all going to lead you down the infectious route. Lots of foamy macrophages or vacuolated pneumocytes. You might think about adverse drug reactions, e valley, which is a vaping-associated lung injury. Obviously, if you see lots of food or foreign material, aspiration is going to be on the top of your list. Hemorrhage and capillaritis in association with the diffuse alveolar damage, that's going to be a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage syndrome. So you might think about um, eosinophilic uh, granulomatosis of polyangiitis or, or GPA, eGPA. And if you see lots of eosinophils, acute eosinophilic pneumonia. All right, so uh, here's just another picture showing that DAD with the hyaline membranes, because I want you to be able to recognize these very pink, dark pink uh, structures approximating your alveolar spaces, okay? Here's a little bit later in the organizational phase, all right? So you're like, well, maybe there's a hyaline membrane, hard to say, but you know, look how look how uh, widened these look by this kind of fibroblastic look to it. It's like organizing pneumonia, but in the interstitium, that's gonna be organizing diffuse alveolar damage. And here's another example of that. So so don't miss this. Look for that, that kind of fibroblastic look in the alveolar septa it tells you organizing stage of DAD. This is very often missed. Without the hyaline membranes, people struggle to recognize DAD for DAD, all right? Viral, some examples of viral cytopathic effects. Of course, if you see these, that will give you your etiology of your DAD, which is very helpful because then they can be treated. Uh, CMV, we're getting a little jump on the infectious uh, uh, section here. CMV will have this uh, distinctive uh, nuclear uh, and cytoplasmic uh, inclusions. Here's HSV. All right, you can see the different uh, HSV inclusions here. You can see some margination here. All right, here's adenovirus and here's measles with the wor worth and uh, Finkel D cell. Again, not something you'll probably ever see in real life, but it's fair games for boards, very distinctive uh, look uh, to these uh, cytopathic inclusions. Probably CMB is the one you're most likely to see. All right, here's a bunch of neutrophils in a case of DAD. So you think infection, even if you don't see the viral cytopathic effects, say refer to cultures. All right, here's some necrosis. Again, you might think infection um, or a viral process. This actually was a, a viral process due to HSV. All right. Granulomas, necrotizing granulomas. This was a, a patient with uh, uh, coccidioides. Uh, anytime you have acute lung injury, you want to do uh, special stains for silver silver stains or a PAS stain for fungus, and also do uh, to look for mycobacteria. You can do a Zeal Nilsen like here. Um, uh, although this is the beautiful control where you see mycobacteria, but the reality, because I always have to put this on here, is more like this, where you just see this this one little guy right there. Um, so if you see necrotizing granulomas in a case of DAD or just necrotizing granulomas, look at high power um, at the areas of necrosis. All right, there it is if you didn't believe me from that. <laughs> All right, so what's helpful for clinicians? Remember, those clinicians already suspect a patient has acute lung injury, right? Um, organizing pneumonia and DAD is fairly distinctive on imaging, and they can at least uh, suspect it, if not outright call it. Um, so etiology, 
like we just talked about, uh, I think they can be broken down into bugs, drugs, and immune thugs. And I have to credit my colleague, Brandon Larson, for coining this phrase. Um, bugs, think about infection and aspiration, drugs, uh, prescription, over-the-counter, illicit, chemotherapy, any, any kind of drug that they're taking. And then the immune thugs, so underlying systemic connective tissue disease or vasculitis. And then, of course, you have to throw idiopathic in there if you can't figure anything else out. And the clinical the clinical breakpoint is here between the bugs and the drugs and the immune thugs, because here they're going to give them antibiotics or antivirals if it's actually a viral infection, and here they're going to give them steroids. So if at all you can make this differentiation, please, please do. Um, so your job one is to recognize that acute lung injury, recognize the DAD, recognize the organizing pneumonia, and then your job two is to help determine the etiology. You're not done after job one. Okay. All right, so let's talk about uh, interstitial lung disease. We're getting closer to the end. Thank you everyone for, for keeping with me here. You only have to know the absolute basics for boards. So we're gonna talk about usual interstitial pneumonia. This is the pattern of interstitial lung disease, uh, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, NSIP, and then lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, okay? And then also you can see airway-centered processes. Okay, so for UIP, the features you need to remember uh, are spatial and temporal heterogeneity. So what I mean by this is that Spatial heterogeneity is that you have areas of fibrosis and damage that are juxtaposed quite abruptly to areas that essentially are normal. And by temporal heterogeneity, I'm talking about uh, new fibrosis, which is the next option, which is the next uh, bullet point here, which is the active fibroplasia, or the fibroblast foci, as well as having old fibrosis, which is collagen fibrosis. You also see honeycomb change. All right, so those are your histologic features that you need to remember for a UIP pattern of fibrosis. UIP is typically associated with the clinical syndrome idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And this is likely the scenario in which you're going to be tested on it. However, I also have to tell you that you can see a UIP pattern of fibrosis with chronic HP, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, adverse drug reactions, and underlying systemic connective tissue diseases. Um, so from a testable standpoint, when you see UIP, think about IPF, um, but do know just in the back of your head that it also can be associated with other diseases as well. It really truly is just a pattern rather than a true diagnosis. So here's an example of a UIP. So you can see this uh, juxtaposition here of all this fibrosis on the left and relatively normal appearing lung on the right. You often see this very distinctive donut sign where the fibrosis feels like it's sort of encroaching in along the intralobular septa. Uh, it'll start uh, pleural based in the lower lobes and sort of creep upwards and creep in. And then at that juncture, you see fibroblast foci. All right, and I'll show you a higher power picture here. All right, so this is a fibroblast focus. This is a fibroblast focus. This is a fibroblast focus. So you can see how these fibroblast foci look like organizing pneumonia, except they're in the interstitium at that interface between fibrotic and non-fibrotic lung. Um, another feature that can help differentiate them is that in fibroblast foci, um, the fibroblasts are oriented parallel to the surface versus in fibroblast plugs in organizing pneumonia, they form these little circles as they form those plugs filling the alveolar spaces and distal bronchioles. All right. Here's honeycomb change, another feature that's important to diagnose, a UIP. Honeycomb change is essentially abnormally dilated and architecturally funny looking uh, spaces lined by respiratory epithelium surrounded by fibrosis. You often have um, debris and mucin and stuff on the inside of these spaces. All right. So this is honeycomb change. Sometimes they can't see this on imaging, and so you only find microscopic honeycomb change. It's important to identify that. Okay. So nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, or NSIP, um, this is a relatively, it's characterized by a relatively homogenous thickening of the alveolar septa. Um, it can be fibrotic, so fibrotic NSIP, um, or it can be a cellular NSIP, or a mixture, fibrotic and cellular NSIP. Um, NSIP can be idiopathic, uh, but it's also often associated with underlying systemic connective tissue diseases. Does your patient have Sjogren's? Does your patient have rheumatoid arthritis? Does your patient have any of the other uh, numerous numbers of CTDs that you can have? An NSIP pattern is what you're going to think of. So if in a question stem they or in a picture they show you an NSIP pattern, which is here, and they say, what likely underlying condition does this patient have? And the question is, you know, um, you know, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, exposure to birds, you know, you're going to pick the rheumatoid arthritis, you're going to pick the underlying connective tissue disease. Um, so here's an example of NSIP where you have this homogenous thickening of the alveolar spaces, right? So it looks the same from pleura to pleura, essentially. All right. Okay, so lymphoid interstitial pneumonia. Uh, this is typically associated also with underlying systemic connective tissue disease. So LIP and NSIP, think about CTDs. 
Okay. Typically on imaging, they'll describe cystic disease, but you almost never see it on histology. I will show you an example though. Um, so they, they'll get this diagnosis of cystic lung disease, and then you get the wedges and you're like, I don't see any cysts. I just see LIP. And that's fine. That's normal. Um, and when you're thinking about LIP, usually you're also thinking that you need to rule out lymphoma. That's a good sign that you're thinking about the right thing. Okay, so here's a rare example of a cystic LIP, both on imaging and on histology. This patient had uh, lupus, and you can see this dense infiltrate adjacent to cysts. More likely what you see is this. So this is LIP where it just looks like sheets of lymphocytes. They're filling the interstitium. You see lots of lymphoid aggregates. You often see things like follicular bronchiolitis, et cetera, et cetera. You might look at this and think, I need to rule out a lymphoma. That's LIP, all right? Here's high power showing you lymphocytes just filling the interstitium. So rule out a lymphoma for sure. Uh, and if they're not and they had an underlying CTD, uh, it's, it's going to be an LIP or they need to look for an underlying CTD. These patients may need to be treated um, as if they have CTD. Okay. All right, so airway-centered process now. Uh, the primary one you need to know is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This is a type 3, type 4 reaction to inhaled organic antigens. And I say type 3, type 4 because there are no eosinophils in HP. Don't think about eosinophils. If you see eosinophils, it's not, it's not HP, okay? It's a type 3, type 4, which is mediated by lymphocytes and plasma cells. Um, this is exposure to inhaled organic antigens uh, from birds. That's a big one. You think of bird fanciers disease, mold, uh, hay. So patient, you know, patients have like water damage in their house that they never that they never took care of. They have down pillows. They have 15 parakeets in their bathroom. None of these are examples I'm having to make up. Um, and uh, those are going to be your patients with HP. It's an airway-centered process, which makes sense because it's an inhalational process. So it's going to affect your airways first. You see uh, that the classic triad is small, loosely formed, non-necrotizing granulomas around the airways with chronic inflammatory infiltrates and chronic bronchiolitis. All right. So here's an example of HP. These granulomas are so loosely formed, you may not recognize them as granulomas at first. Um, here's two here. There's another one here. There's another one up here. Very loosely formed collections of these basically epithelioid histiocytes and lymphocytes and plasma cells. All right. A little bit of chronic bronchiolitis in the background here as well. Uh, here's another example. You can see giant cells. You don't have to see giant cells. You often do. And then here's those little granulomas that I've circled here. Very indistinct. Okay. There's another one there. Uh, so this is okay. This is a, an interstitial lung disease you can actually suggest on transbronchial biopsy. Okay. Um, so I want to do a quick comment on smoking-related lung disease. So there's a lot of terminology surrounding it, which I think can be confusing. Um, respiratory bronchiolitis is those lightly pigmented macrophages that start around alveolar spaces. They can progress to what is called desquamative interstitial pneumonia, which doesn't have anything to do with squames at all. Um, it's basically just I think of it as really bad respiratory bronchiolitis. You basically have those pigmented smoker's macrophages filling your alveolar spaces. You can get smoking-related interstitial fibrosis uh, with uh, where you get these hyalinized fibrosis, all right, emphysema, of course, and then pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis is almost 99% associated with uh, smoking. So here's an example of uh, many of those features. So you see this uh, sort of hyalinized, bright pink ropey look. It kind of looks like that NSIP case I showed you. And in fact, many pictures of NSIP in textbooks are actually just smoking-related interstitial lung disease. Um, but that's, a, that's an aside. Uh, so this is smoking-related interstitial fibrosis. And then you can see all these macrophages filling the spaces. All right, here's a higher power. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the emphysema as well, these enlarged air spaces as well as emphysema, although emphysema is really not a, a pathologic diagnosis. Uh, so here's higher power showing you respiratory bronchiolitis. Okay, And uh, these smokers' macrophages have a very fine powdery pigment uh, in contrast to hemosiderin-laden macrophages, which will give you a chunkier uh, golden brown um, look. So uh, iron stain won't help you, iron are in both. Uh, and then you'll often see these little anthracotic uh, dark black flecks in smokers macrophages as well. There's one, there's one, and there's one. Okay. So PLCH, definitely something you need to be able to recognize. Um, almost all of them are associated with smokers. You can see them on biopsies. You can uh, see them as secondary diagnoses and wedges or lobectomies for patients with um, carcinoma who also smoke. They start out as cellular nodules, and then over time, they become stellate fibrotic nodules. These also, like LIP, have a cystic finding on imaging um, because they're not true cysts, but those stellate fibrotic nodules pull in uh, the pulmonary parenchyma and create cystic spaces around them. 
All right, so that's where you get that cystic look on imaging. Uh, fibrotic burned out PLCH is going to have just a few or no Langerhan cells. Uh, so what they always seem to test you on is the Langerhan cells. What stain? CD1A, S100, beer bet granules on electron microscopy, even though I'm pretty sure no one's done electron microscopy on PLCH in like 50 years. But it's still fair game. Um, but those cellular nodules will have, of course, those Langerhan cells uh, that will stain with CD1A or S100. I usually just do a CD1A. Um, and uh, together with chronic inflammatory infiltrate that's mixed, including eosinophils and those pigmented macrophages that I showed you. All right. So here's a cellular nodule on biopsy. All right. And it's you can see some uh, mixed inflammatory cells, um, eosinophils, maybe an eosinophil here or there. Hard to say for sure. But then there's some lightly pigmented cells. This patient is a smoker. And you do a CD1A and you see there's a million Langerhans cells there. So you're done with that diagnosis. That's a cellular nodule of PLCH. Um, here's a, a wedge resection that had incidental PLCH. Uh, you see right here, you can see these um, admixed, uh, uh, mixed inflammatory cells with a smoker's macrophages. PLCH gives you that, or sorry, CD1A uh, gives you that beautiful um, uh, staining of the Langerhans cells, giving you a diagnosis of PLCH. Here's a mixed cellular and fibrotic nodule. So a little more cellular on the right, a little less cellular on the left. Um, so fewer Langerhans cells, they start to diminish over time. And then here's a completely fibrotic nodule with a kind of cystic change around it. You do a CD1A on this, you're not gonna really see anything. All right, so these are the ones you don't wanna miss. Okay, so let's talk about a few infectious processes. All right, so this is aspergillus. Uh, this is invasive aspergillus. Here's angioinvasive aspergillus. Here are fruiting heads. Um, if you see fruiting heads on septated hyphae, you can actually make a diagnosis on biopsy of aspergillus. Otherwise, you should just be descriptive. All right. Uh, aspergillus, remember, they're septated. They have a 45 degree angle branching. All right. If this is all you have, you can just say, uh, sign it out as a septated uh, 45 degree angle branching. Uh, you know, verticultures could be aspergillus. But if you see the fruiting heads, you can call aspergillus. Uh, mucormycosis. Uh, this is a zygomyces. You need, to, you need to be able to recognize this one. They have these ribbon-like uh, look to them. They're posse septate, actually. So there are rare septate here, um, but they shouldn't have very many. And they have a very broad look to them. And they have this twisted ribbon look for mucormycosis. Um, you're typically only going to see these in very immunocompromised patients, like a transplant patient. Here's a higher power picture showing you that twisted ribbon look of mucormycosis. Here's an example of candida. Again, not commonly something you'll see on a biopsy. They'll typically get this on culture, uh, but you can see a, a, a pneumonia with candida. This is this uh, meatball look, and sometimes like the spaghetti and meatball look of candida. This is just on H&E. You don't even need a special stain to see it. Here's nocardia. This is a necrotizing pneumonia caused by nocardia. Uh, this is actually nocardia on a on a GMS stain, a silver stain. Uh, you actually can see them on silver. Uh, you don't have to use a fight. In fact, I like silver stains for nocardia. You get these sort of tangled nests, a very, very thin look of these tangled nests, and that's specific for nocardia. And there's a, a little a different picture as well. All right, pneumocystis. Uh, pneumocystis has a crushed ping pong ball look. All right, sometimes a little central dot. You can actually see it here on H&E. Usually you can appreciate that dot better on cytology, though. All right, uh, on H&E, um, sorry, on the, this is not H&E, GMS stain. Um, on H&E, you see fluffy pink materials in the alveolar spaces. This used to be very, very, very common back when HIV um, was uh, more uncontrolled in the population. You would see uh, this on biopsy. Now it's pretty rare, but I think it's uh, a distinctive enough appearance that you should uh, be able to recognize it as pneumocystis. Uh, here is histoplasma. Um, histoplasma can be really hard to see on H&E, um, but if you start to see these tiny little dot-like structures, uh, very small, it's smaller than pneumocystis. Um, this, in this particular case, it's actually disseminated because it's filling macrophages. On uh, GMS, uh, histoplasma will have narrow-based budding. Okay, you often see these in old hyalinized granulomas. It's like an old remote infection. But if you see them in macrophages, that's indicative of a disseminated process, and you definitely want to call your clinician for those cases. Um, and there's that disseminated one again. All right, here's blasto. So blasto is going to have a broad-based budding. Here are a couple of cytology specimens, a pap stain and a diffquick. And here is a, a GMS stain of blasto as well. All right, with that broad-based budding right there. So remember for blasto, broad-based budding. Okay, there's another just an H&E example with uh, some necrosis, necrotizing granuloma. Oh, and I think I showed you this earlier and I called it uh, coccidioides, perhaps. Hopefully I didn't. It's definitely a uh, blasto. <laughs> um, so here's coccidioides. 
All right, so this is just a necrotizing lesion. Um, for coccidioides, you look for thick-walled spherules with endospores spilling out. Um, uh, can be confused with blasto because they also have a, this thick wall look, but uh, coccidioides will be more variably sized and they'll have these spherules uh, with endospores. All right, there's a GMS stain with coccidioides, very, very distinctive. They should show you something like this if they want you to identify cocci. Here's cryptococcus. A uh, cryptococcus has uh, halos around it. It's actually just a, an artifact, um, but it is quite distinctive and you can't see it there. And there's cryptococcus on uh, GMS. All right, and this also has narrow base budding, just like histo, but will be uh, much larger than histo and variably sized in contrast to histo. So here's a chart, if you're a chart person, talking about the different uh, features of uh, these fungi here. Okay. So I do apologize, thank you for everyone for staying with me uh, late. We ha now have uh, systemic vasculitic syndromes. Uh, these are ones you don't wanna miss and I think they're also quite testable. Okay, so granulomatosis with polyangiitis or GPA, this was formerly Wegner's. I finally stopped writing Wegner's because we have to stop eventually. Um, for GPA, remember C. ancas, this is seen in the majority. Uh, in the real world though, it's not required for diagnosis, but on a board exam question, they're gonna tell you C. anca or ask you which anca study or which study and you should come up with C. anca. The classic triad of involvement is pulmonary manifestations, uh, which is often as bilateral nodules or masses together with sinusitis and glomerulonephritis. So you might get a clinical picture of a patient with uh, kidney failure and chronic sinusitis that they can't heal. And now they're having lesions on imaging. And then they might show you some photos and ask you, what does this patient have or what studies might you want to do? Um, these masses often cavitate. Um, they will have vasculitis as well, which has a distinctive segmental look to it. Um, patients with GPA can also present with more of a diffuse process of uh, DAH, um, and the necrosis they have is very basophilic. Okay, and I'll show you some pictures here in a second after I talk about eGPA, which is another systemic vasculitic syndrome that can involve the lung. So this is just like GPA except with the eosinophils, and this is where you'll see pianca, although it's actually a little less of half that have piancas, but again, they always ask you pianca with eGPA. All right, um, and these patients will almost always have a history of asthma, and they commonly will have peripheral eosinophilia and eosinophils on their BALs. Um, so they'll have eosinophilic pneumonia, uh, vasculitis, which is segmental, uh, similar to GPA, but it'll have lots of eosinophils, necrotizing granulomas, again, just like you can see in GPA, but with eosinophils, um, and they can also have diffuse alveolar hemorrhage with capillaritis, except with eosinophils. So that's why eosinophilic is in the name, lots of eos. Okay, so here is an example of GPA. This is a wedge resection. You can see on low power, um, there's this quite basophilic or blue necrosis, and that's because of all the neutrophils. You see neutrophilic micro microabscesses with GPA. Um, and also sometimes you'll see these distinctive uh, giant cells. They're sometimes called Wegner's uh, giant cells because we still haven't gotten rid of the name there, uh, where you have these very hyperchromatic nuclei uh, pushed out to the periphery. Uh, not specific, but helpful if you see them. Uh, here's a, a microabscess here that you can see in GPA, and here's a segmental um, vasculitis. So you see how this is actually a vessel wall, right? This is a vessel right here. A little bit of the vessel wall is completely normal on the intima, and then you just have complete blown through destruction on the rest. All right, here's another example of that segmental vasculitis. So here's a large pulmonary artery right here. You can see there's just some segments that are damaged all through the wall. Okay, and remember a little bit of inflammation around the outside of a vessel does not equal vasculitis. You wanna see uh, in the intima of the media uh, for true vasculitis. Okay, so we were talking about eGPA and eosinophilic pneumonia. Let's talk about eosinophilic pneumonia in general. So you can have acute eosinophilic pneumonia or chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. AEP is much rarer to actually diagnose on histology in contrast to CEP. So in AEP, these patients will have fever, shortness of breath, lung infiltrates. It has to be less than a month to qualify as AEP. These patients um, have diffuse alveolar damage plus EOs right? So that's AEP. Um, they can be idiopathic. In fact, most of them are, but they also can be seen in association with drugs. So say a patient started a new uh, chemotherapy uh, regime and comes in with these diffuse um, diffuse infiltrates and, you know, peripheral eosinophilia, you know, this, this could be due to that drug infection. Abrupt changes in smoking habits actually can give you eosinophilic pneumonia, whether it's starting or stopping. And on, on, a, on histology, like I said, you look for diffuse alveolar damage plus EOs. Now, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia is a little bit more common uh, to diagnose. Similar symptoms to AEP, but less severe, and they tend to be more insidious on their onset, and they tend to be relapsing and recurring, relapsing, recurring, and they're very responsive to steroids. Um, AEP is also responsive to steroids along with chronic. Um, 
these patients, these cases are often uh, idiopathic, and half of those cases, the patients have asthma. They tend to have these eosinophil problems, right? Um, you can see it in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, so it's kind of a hypersensitivity reaction to eosinophils. You can see chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, drugs, infection, connective tissue diseases, and EGPA, like we were just talking about. Um, you'll see eosinophils unsurprisingly, um, that can form microapsises. You can see them in the interstitium, filling the alveolar spaces. Uh, and for the acute lung injury component, you'll see organizing pneumonia with this, and you'll also see giant cells. All right. And remember, these are steroid responsive. If you see these cases, pick up the phone and call your clinician. Don't set it aside for a couple of days because steroids can really, really help these patients regardless of the underlying etiology. All right, so here's an example of acute eosinophilic pneumonia. You can see some sort of hyaline, hyaline membranes, fibrin accumulation here, uh, and then sheets of eosinophils. All right, here's a case of chronic. Here's a plug of organizing pneumonia. Lots of eosinophils. I don't think they're projecting very well, but they definitely are there. All right, here's, here's a different uh, spot from there. Uh, sheets of eosinophils in a CEP case. All right. Uh, here's a necrotizing kind of granulomatous look with these sort of eosinophilic microabscesses in a case of EGPA. All right. Okay. So I want to show you aspiration because I want you to be able to recognize aspiration. So this is uh, degenerating food uh, in a patient who's aspirating. Um, they often, you don't often see the beautiful plant material. Oftentimes you just see these little wiggly worm-like looks and these are old lentils. All right. So that's food. If you get lucky, you see the big plant material with the rigid cell walls, um, but you don't always, but I wanted to show you one. Here's a uh, little more plant food there. They can be really indistinct and you really might not be sure. And again, remember, you can see this in association with organizing pneumonia, with diffuse alveolar damage, a little bit of chronic change. Um, you can see granulomas. Here's some more food right there. This is in the wall of an airway with a little granuloma forming around it. All right, a little bit higher power picture. You can see this one's a little more obvious. This one's a little less obvious. All right. So with that, I will end. And I really appreciate everyone staying with me an hour and 39 minutes for this whirlwind uh, board review for pulmonary pathology. And I'm happy to take any questions if anyone is still awake. We should thank you, Dr. Bud. This was really a very, very comprehensive overview uh, for both neoplastic and non-neoplastic uh, pathology for, for lung. And I'm sure that trainees would find it really very helpful and not necessarily just the trainees. And I'm sure uh, for practicing pathologists as well. Uh, if you don't mind, you might uh, stop sharing, Dr. Bud. Yes. Your screen. I could do that. Thank you. Uh, there are a few questions. So I will read them for you. Uh, one question is about... Uh, what IC panel would you recommend to differentiate between enteric type pulmonary adenocarcinoma and mm -hmm. colorectal adenocarcinoma in mm -hmm. the metastatic setting, say the patient has both lung and colonic mass? I think you discussed it, but still you might want to take that. Yeah, no, that's a great question that has definitely come up um, more than once for me. I think if the patient has colon cancer and then they have multiple lesions in the lung, clinically, that's going to be metastatic colon cancer. Um, sometimes if you have a case where, say, you've done some stains and it stains with TTF1 and the patient also has colon cancer that was previously diagnosed, I will actually pull the colon cancer case and do a TTF1 um, and have, in in a few rare cases, found them to be, to be positive. And so in that case, um, you would you would favor a metastatic colon cancer. The reality is, is there is no one stain that will definitively differentiate between the two because enteric type uh, lung adenocarcinoma can stain exactly like colon cancer. So you really have to go with the clinical picture in cases like that. Um, and in my experience, if the patient has colon cancer and lung lesions, it's almost always gonna be metastatic colon cancer. Because if you think about it, um, the odds of having an enteric type primary lung adenocarcinoma and colon cancer is, diminishingly, it's almost impossible, right? Like it's not impossible because nothing is, but it's, it would be extremely unusual. Um, in contrast to colon cancer loves to metastasize to the lung. Now, if the patient has multiple lung masses and it's an enteric type and you think, well, could it be metastatic colon cancer and the patient has no colon cancer diagnosis, I think you have to do a colonoscopy to rule that out. And if the colonoscopy rules out a colon cancer, then it's just uh, intrapulmonary mets of enteric type um, cancer. So there's no stain. There's no one stain that will tell you for sure. And you have to correlate with clinical history. Uh, thank but you thank so you. That's much. a great uh, question. Dr. But I think I think this is a great answer from you as well. And uh, I'm a GI pathologist, so I I, I face this uh, question or problem in practice all the time. And as you said rightly, that uh, probably do a TTF one in the colon cancer as well if your TTF one yep. is 
positive because, and as you said rightly, that uh, no immunostain is going to help in this setting. I think this is a great takeaway. Thank you so much. I like the word diminishingly rare. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, there, there is another question about uh, okay. how how can we differentiate mucopidermoid carcinoma from adenosquamous carcinoma? That's a great question. Um, so for mucoepidermoid carcinoma versus adenosquamous carcinoma, there are a couple of features that can help you. So one, if you see keratinization, that's going to favor an adenosquamous carcinoma. If you see an in situ carcinoma uh, element, that's also going to favor an adenosquamous carcinoma. A higher grade lesion, so higher grade cytologic features is going to favor an adenosquamous carcinoma. Um, you know, Oftentimes, that's how those cases will come to me. Um, you know, it'll be a high-grade adenosquame versus a high-grade mucoep, and those can be really challenging because they're often mammal 2 negative. And so if I have a case where the mammal 2 is negative and it's high-grade, older patient, I'm, I'm almost always going to favor an adenosquame. Um, you know, if that mammal 2 is positive, of course, that you're done. Like it's not an adenosquamous carcinoma. It's a, it's a mucoepidermoid carcinoma, but features that will favor adenosquame will be the higher grade cytologic features, presence of keratinization and presence of an in situ component. Right. Uh, thank you. So here's the next question. Uh, can you do a KI67 on FNA from the lung? I think uh, the viewer is referring to a neuroendocrine tumor. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so if you have a cell block, of course, you could you could do a K67 on a, on fine needle aspirations, and I would actually recommend it. Um, right now, the WHO doesn't require uh, KI67 for neuroendocrine lesions in the lung, but it is, uh, I can't remember what term they use, preferred or recommended or something like that. I, I think that the MIB can be very helpful in smaller, when you have smaller amount of tumor cells, which you often might have in an FNA. Um, so I would say if you, if you can get a cell block and you can do the stain to, to recommend doing it, because um, sometimes it might be hard to tell a crushed carcinoid tumor apart from a small cell carcinoma. And of course, those are going to have vastly different prognoses and treatments. Um, so yes, I would do it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bert. Uh, I have one question from my side uh, on yeah. this topic, like uh, that classification of neuroendocrine tumors in the lung and the mm -hmm. GI tract seems mm -hmm. uh, not congruent, right? And yeah. as far as GI and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are concerned, KI67 plays a very important role, whereas uh, not so in the lung. So any particular insight? Yeah, about that? so I, I can talk about that for a while, but I'll try to keep it brief. I, I it, it is a little frustrating that we have not uh, moved to be in line with the GI uh, reporting. I think right now, you know, a typical carcinoid tumor corresponds to neuroendocrine tumor grade one for GI, atypical neuroendocrine grade two. Um, I didn't talk about it, but there is a tumor that has carcinoid morphology, but increased mitotic uh, rate. Uh, so it has way more than, you know, 10 per high power field, but it looks like a carcinoid tumor. And so those kind of fall into this what is likely corresponding to grade three neuroendocrine tumors in the GI tract, um, but they still don't have a home in, in the WHO for thoracic tumors. So, so unfortunately we don't, right now we're still with mitotic index and necrosis for between typical and atypical carcinoid or neuroendocrine tumor grade one, grade two. Uh, we don't have a technical category yet for grade three, but I, I'm hoping in the next iteration of the WHO, we will. Um, it, they look like carcinoid tumors, but they have a higher proliferative index. Um, and then of course, small cell carcinoma and large cell endocrine carcinoma have uh, different morphologies. And so we're able to differentiate those based on those. Uh, we do have overlapping uh, percentages for large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma and small cell. So small cell can be a little bit on the lower end, you know, 75, 80%. Um, and large cell can be on that higher end, 75, 80%, um, but typically tends to be a little lower and small cell tends to be a little higher. And then you can use morphology to help differentiate between the two. Um, it is my hope that we will move more towards uh, aligning with our with our GI colleagues. But as of now, um, we don't. Uh, it's not required, but I think it's highly, I would highly recommend doing the neuroendocrine when you have neuroendocrine tumors to do um, a, a MIB. I do on all of my cases and I report the results. Right. Thank you. Uh, so staying with neuroendocrine tumors, there is another question from another viewer that uh, how frequently do you use INSM1 in neuroendocrine tumors of the lung? That's a great question. So INSM1 is actually a pretty good marker. I would say it's synonymous with synaptophysin and chromogranin. Um, you know, this is a topic that we've actually discussed in our in our Palm Path Journal Club uh, more than once. And I think the 
general experience and my experience as well has been that if there is a case that is negative for synaptophysin and chromogranin, it's probably also going to be negative for INSM1. Um, so I, I don't feel that it significantly adds. Um, if I do have a case where I really need a neuroendocrine marker to be positive, I, I, I will use it. Um, I would say you could use it in place of synaptophysin or chromogranin. I think it's it's been shown to be a robust marker. Um, for me, um, I, I'm still, I guess I'm old school, I still just use synaptochromo and that's seems to work for me. The time in which I use additional neuroendocrine markers like CD56, and which is very nonspecific, and INSM1, which is which is a reasonable marker, is when I have a tumor that looks for all the world like a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, and I'm convinced that's what it is based on the morphology, and I need a stain. Because the WHO requires at least one neuroendocrine marker to be positive for large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, that's when I tend to do additional markers like CD56, um, and then I'll throw an INSM1 on. But I think it's a great marker. Um, I would never dissuade anyone from using it. To me, it's not worth adding it and doing three stains. I would say if you were going to use it, maybe do it instead of one of the other uh, markers. Um, but I, in my experience, I have not found synaptochroma negative cases to be then INSM1 positive. And I think the literature uh, reflects that for the majority of cases. I think that's a great take uh, on the utility of the INSM1. As you say that uh, probably only INSM1 positive case, cases with chromosynaptor negative will be yeah. diminishingly rare, as you said before. Yes. So uh, one question on that, uh, what is your experience about poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumor carcinomas, like small cell or large cell losing mm -hmm. chromogranin, as we often see in GI side? And uh, what is your take on that? And do you see yeah. like, like positivity for chromogranin in those cases? Or, or mm -hmm. what do you see? What's your experience on that? So there's definitely a, a cohort of small cell carcinoma cases that will be negative for all neuroendocrine markers, INSM1, chromo, synapto, even negative for TTF1. Um, and I think for small cell carcinoma, it truly is a morphologic diagnosis. So if you've ruled out a basaloid squame, which I think or an lymphoma, which is probably the only two major differentials, um, I feel comfortable uh, calling um, a small cell carcinoma in the absence of neuroendocrine markers. You know, you're going to have keratin positivity, uh, of course, and you want to see that dot-like positivity in your keratin, which can be very helpful. Um, another stain, uh, CK903, can be helpful when you're when you're trying to differentiate between a small cell carcinoma and a and a a, a basaloid squame that may not be cooperating. Um, you know, so so for small cell, as long as everything else fits, even if there aren't neuroendocrine markers, I will still call it, uh, especially in the right clinical context to smoker with the, you know, central lesion. For large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, you do have to have a neuroendocrine marker. So if if chromogranin and synapto are done, as I mentioned before, that's when I might try a CD56. And usually I've had good luck with patchy CD56 staining. Um, it's one of those, you know, less specific stains, but actually really helps you out when, when the morphology is... Um, consistent with a large cell and you've ruled out uh, other other possibilities. Right. No, thanks again. Thanks a lot. Uh, one question is about how can you differentiate uh, mucinous adenocarcinoma of the lung from metastatic mucinous adenocarcinoma? Beautiful question. You guys are hitting on all the on all on all the on all the big things. Um, uh, the short answer is you can't. Uh, which is why I typically don't do stains uh, for mucinous adenocarcinoma in the lung. Uh, similar to the, the, the enteric type adenocarcinoma, uh, clinical history is really important because mucinous adenocarcinomas of the lung can be positive or negative for CK7, CK20, CDX2, SATB2. Um, it's, it's not, they're not helpful. The stains are not helpful. Uh, and so, you know, if you had strong TTF1 positivity, strong CK7, negative CK20, negative everything, and the patient has nothing else going on, you could argue, oh yeah, that would be helpful. Um, but that doesn't always happen. Uh, and I have found that usually uh, for mucinous adenocarcinoma of the lung, there'll be little patchy CK7, little patchy CDX2, little patchy CK20, TTF negative, you know, maybe a rare cell staining. Is it a, actually a, a cancer cell staining? Is it not? And then, oh, the patient has a large pancreatic mass. What does the patient have? The patient has metastatic pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Um, so the stains could potentially be helpful, especially if you have two different tumors. Like if you have a lung cancer and you have a pancreatic cancer and you're worried the patient actually has both, you can stain both cases and see if they have the same staining pattern or different staining pattern. Um, I tend to take those on a case-by-case -case basis as well as comparing the morphologies. Um, one note I will make on pancreatic adenocarcinomas is they can grow in a lipidic growth pattern as a MET, which can be very confusing because they look exactly like lung primary uh, mucinous 
mucinous adenocarcinoma? So the short answer is they don't help. Um, and the longer answer is, is in isolated situations, if you have samples from both tumors, it may be worthwhile to stain both tumors to see um, if they have the same staining profile. Right, thank you. Uh, this is the next question. What do you think about the use of elastin stain for the diagnosis of visceral pleural invasion? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I use it. Uh, and I will often stain multiple blocks. Uh, I think that uh, using it can be very helpful. I actually use an elastic trichrome stain. So it's a, it's a mixed stain. I know some people will use a Movat as well. Um, elastin, the, the, the original like old school elastin stain, I tend not to use that one as much just because I don't like it as much. But staining for the elastic fibers, I think is very useful and very helpful. And so visceral pleural invasion is defined by invasion through the thickest layer of the, of the pleura, which is most often the outer layer of the pleura. Um, and I have seen cases where I am absolutely convinced it's gonna be invasive and I do the elastic stain and it's not. And I've seen cases where I was like, oh, you know, it's probably okay. And then you do the elastic stain and you see the tumor just blowing through it. Um, so I, I highly recommend the use of elastic trichrome or you know, and anything that stains the elastic layer, highly recommend using that. And even on uh, multiple blocks in a case, especially where you're suspicious. And especially in cases where it changes the stage, because for smaller lesions, if you have invasion into the visceral pleura, it'll change it, it'll change it to a PT2. And so I think that has a significance for the patient. So yes, do it. Thank you. So one more question, which is more broad, is that can we rely on cytopathology for any lung cancer? So what's the <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, of course. I think you can rely on cytopathology for lung cancer. Um, you know, a lot of these tumors can be bi uh, diagnosed on smaller biopsies on on cyto on cytospecimens, and cytospecimens are really good for molecular, which is becoming really important. Um, there are certainly tumors that I would want to have uh, more tissue, or maybe you have to wait for a resection. So it's not so much a biopsy versus cytology; it's it's more just you need a resection, like a large cell carcinoma, a rare diagnosis you wouldn't make, or you know, a sarcomatoid carcinoma, a pleomorphic carcinoma. You need to see certain percentages. Adenosquamous carcinoma. You need to see a resection. So I think outside of the tumors where you require a resection specimen for a definitive diagnosis, uh, most you can definitely diagnose uh, on cytology. Always a little bit harder with smaller cytospecimens. And I have seen cases where you people have gone down the tubes making an incorrect diagnosis or maybe missing the bigger picture um, if you only have a piece of a tumor and you don't see like the more poorly differentiated component or something like that. Um, but but I definitely think you can you can make some great diagnoses on on, on cytospecimens. Thank you. That's that's a uh, uh, I think very uh, useful. I think uh, answer. As a full order. disclosure, I'm not a cytopathologist. I don't sign out cytology. So, <laughs> so there is one last question for you, Doctor. But I'm sure you must be tired after this. Uh, oh no, it's fine. Two hours. <laughs> so the question is about pulmonary blastoma. Do you, is it associated with Dicer one syndrome? That's the question. Uh, yes, they can be. Okay. Yeah, I think these are all the questions that I could see on uh, both Facebook and YouTube. And thank you again, Dr. Butt, for this excellent review uh, for pulmonary pathology. And as you said, that it's really whirlwind and covering neoplastic as well as non-neoplastic. And I'm sure our viewers and the trainees would find them really, very helpful. And we really appreciate it so much uh, for your time and effort. And uh, we had a lot of viewers who joined from different parts of the world. There were viewers who joined from Kenya, um, Germany, I saw people joined from India and uh, USA as well. And uh, thanks to our viewers. And we have our next session on next Tuesday, that is May 9th, and that would be a pediatric pathology session. And our speaker will be Dr. Tionia Boyd, who would be joining from uh, Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital. And she is going to give a talk on uh, placental pathology, that's the maternal and fetal vascular mal from mal malperfusion. So hope to see you at that time. And the time will be the same at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And for those uh, preparing for boards, so we have quite a few board uh, related sessions. Maybe you can go to the YouTube channel and find them. That would be helpful. And thank you again, Dr. Bhatt. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.